Good evening. I declare the meeting open at one minute past six. I'd like to start the meeting by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and on behalf of the City of Vincent pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, CEO, do we have any apologies or members on leave of absence? Uh, through you, no, Mayor Cole. I've not received any. Okay, thank you. I'll just note that Councillor Harley is running late, um, but likely to be here shortly. Um, in relation to um, public question time, I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's meeting, members of the public gallery. Um, we do have public question time now. This is your opportunity to approach the microphone and speak on an item on the agenda or raise another matter with Council. And we do ask that you state your name, your address and the item to which you're speaking. And we do ask that you speak um, no more than three minutes. So there's no particular order. It's just a matter of who would wish to approach the microphone first. So please go ahead. Nicole, yes, that's the case. We received a petition in relation to item 9.3 on tonight's agenda, which is the same item as uh, Mr. Gell referred to. Uh, it is from Mr J Evans of Maple Street, North Perth, and contains 45 signatures from local residents and businesses in the area opposing the extension and upgrade of the telecommunication facility on Blake Street, North Perth. Um, council members, in accordance with the meeting procedures local law, uh, clause 2.24, there are a number of options available to council in considering um, this particular petition, they are, I'll just recite them for you. Uh, the motions that Council can consider in dealing with a petition are firstly that the petition be received, or that the petition be received and a report be prepared, or the petition be received and referred to a committee for consideration and report, or lastly that the petition be received and be dealt with by the Council. Uh, my advice, Council members, would be uh, to pursue that last. Um, option that's available to you, that is that the petition be received and be dealt with by the Council as part of its determination of item 9.3 on tonight's agenda. I would agree, unless there's any objections from any Council members. Okay, I'll put that we receive the petition and deal with it um, as a Council uh, in accordance with item 9.3 on tonight's agenda. Do I have a mover, please? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? I declare that carried. Thank you. Um, we now have confirmation of minutes and we do have three sets of minutes. We have the ordinary meeting of the 1st of May 2018. Can I please have a mover and a seconder? Move Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Harley. All those in favour? Declare the minutes carried. We have the special council meeting of the 8th of May 2018. Can I please have a mover? Move Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour? Declare the minutes carried and the special council meeting of the 15th of May 2018. Moved by Councillor Lowden, seconded by Councillor Murphy. All those in favour, I declare the special council meeting minutes carried. Thank you. Um, we'll now go to announcements by the presiding member. I do have a few announcements this evening. I'd like to um, first of all start by welcoming Luke Gibson to the role of Acting Director of Development Services. Um, Luke has joined us on a secondment from the, um, from the um, City of Gosnells. Yes, I was thinking city or town, City of Gosnells, um, and has come to us as a manager from there. So this is a great development opportunity for Luke and it also is a great opportunity for our director, John Corbellini, to take um, parental leave and spend time with his new baby. So we wish you both well. Um, I'd also just like to note that we are now operating under our new meeting procedures local law, just so that um, everyone's aware. A few small changes to our standing orders have been modernised to be uh, much more descriptive of what they actually are, and they are the rules that govern our meetings, so just to note that. Also, it has been talked about much, but just to mention that we're also now operating under local planning scheme two. Um, we have talked about this a lot recently, but it has been 10 years in the making, so it was an extremely big deal for us as a, a council and community in that we finally have a modern scheme that reflects our planning future here in Vincent with um, a good balance between protecting our residential neighbourhoods and seeing development along our corridors and in our town centres so that we're meeting our density targets and 
diversifying and maintaining our vibrancy um, and also seeing a lot of um, encouragement of development around transport hubs. The main um, that has caused a lot of attention would be Claysbrook where we finally have an end date on the sticky point of the two concrete batching plants which has really been holding Claysbrook back over a long period of time. So that's a fantastic outcome for Claysbrook which we hope to see fulfil its potential as a vibrant inner city hub which would be a great place to live and work. So it was very important for us that our community sentiments were expressed and upheld in our scheme. I believe that that has been the case and that the state government ultimately um, was respectful and supportive of that vision. Also just to note that it is Reconciliation Week and that we are, we are celebrating Reconciliation Week in the City of Vincent. We have our um, Reconciliation Week banners displayed in North Perth and Mount Hawthorne. We have um, a range of cultural events and free films screening during this week in celebration of Aboriginal culture and history. Um, and Council is being represented at Walk for Reconciliation this Friday by myself and Councillor Gontoshevsky and um, last night at the Reconciliation Week Street banner project launch um, by myself and Councillor Dan Loden. So, um, yes, we're just um, enjoying celebrating all the great things that can come through reconciliation and building partnerships with Aboriginal people and communities. Also, just to mention that Beaufort Street Network, which was the first town team, not only in Vincent, but in Perth and perhaps in, in the world, if Councillor Jimmy Murphy can maybe give me the nod on that one. Absolutely. The, the founding town team of the now moving global town team movement is having a recharged event on Monday the 18th of June. They are looking for new people to join their town team. They're wanting to, as they say, recharge and reinvigorate, find some fresh blood to get involved. And they're inviting people along on Monday the 18th of June from 6pm at the Queen's Hotel to hear from members past and to hear about their exciting plans for the future and hopefully get some new people to, um, to recharge and reinvigorate that um, fantastic town team. That's it from me on announcements. Um, and now I'll go to declarations of interest. Thank you, Mayor Cole. We've received a few. The first, and I'll read these out in order that the items appear on the agenda. The first is from Councillor Dan Loden. It's a disclosure of impartiality interest on item 9.5, Coogee Street, Mount Hawthorne. The extent of Councillor Loden's interest in this matter is that he saw the applicants at the Mount Hawthorne Streets and Lanes Festival when he was running the AMDF stall. Uh, that's the Australian Motor Neurone Disease Foundation. Sorry, Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Um, he mentioned the application, that is the applicant, mentioned the application was in the works and would be away when it came to council and also made a donation to the AMDF. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Council Loden's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Council Loden has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. The next is a disclosure of impartiality interest from Councillor Susan Gondoshevsky on item 11.1, .1, leases to Department of Health. The extent of Councillor Gondoshevsky's interest in this matter is that she is an employee of the Department of Health who operates and is the recommended lessee of the child health clinics referred to in administration's report. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Gondoshevsky's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Gondoshevsky has declared that she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. We've received a disclosure of impartiality interest also from Councillor Joanne Fatakis in relation to item 12.3, festivals and events sponsorship. The nature of Councillor Fatakis's interest in this matter is that she is a past member of the Board of Leaderville Connect and organising committee of the 2018 Leedy Palooza event. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Fatakis's impartiality on the matter could be affected. Councillor Fatakis has de declared she will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I've received a disclosure of financial interest from Councillor Jimmy Murphy on item 12.3, festivals and event sponsorship. The extent of Councillor Murphy's interest is that he is contracted by Mount Hawthorne Hub and Leadable Connect to assist in the delivery of their festivals. Councillor Murphy is not seeking any approval from Council to participate in the debate or remain in chambers or vote on the matter when it is discussed. On the same item, 12.3, we've also received a disclosure of financial interest from Councillor Alex Castle. 
The extent of Council Castle's interest in this matter is that she has a financial relationship with Mount Hawthorne Hub as she provided graphic design services for the 2018 Mount Hawthorne Streets and Lanes Festival. Uh, Councillor Castle is also not seeking any approval from Council to participate in the debate or remain in chambers or vote on the matter when it is discussed. And the last disclosure of interest is from me, Council Members, Len Kosova. Uh, it's an impartiality interest disclosure on item 13.2, uh, recruitment for CEO. Um, it's probably quite obvious, but I'll state it nonetheless. Um, the extent of my interest in this matter is that it relates to the appointment of a consultant to assist Council in recruiting for the position that I currently hold. As a consequence, there may be a perception that my impartiality on the matter could be affected. Thank you very much, CEO. Um, we will now go around the chamber to see whether there are items that council members wish to pull forward for debate. Start with Councillor Hallett. Councillor Castle. Uh, 10.2 and 12.1, please. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Nothing for me. Mate. Councillor Murphy. Uh, 10.3, please. <coughs> Councillor Loden. Uh, 9.5 and 10.1. Councillor Fatakis, Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, 9.1, um, I think 11.1 and 13.2. Thank you. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, um, just for uh, the avoidance of any doubt, um, for council members as well as members of the public gallery and anyone else streaming into the council meeting, um, I'll just recite now the items that will be adopted by council on block in accordance with the officer recommendations. Um, these items have not been the subject of a public question, nor are they absolute majority items, or have had a financial or proximity interest disclosed by a council member. Um, and nor are they absolute majority decisions. So the following items which Council will now be adopting on block are item 9.2, item 9.4, item 9.6, item 10.4, item 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, 12.2 and 13.1. The other items will all be discussed individually. Thank you, CEO. Can I please have a mover and a seconder for the on block items? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Murphy. All those in favour? Declare the on block items carried. Um, we'll now go to the item first raised from the public gallery, the only item raised from the public gallery this evening, and that is item 9.3, number 1 to 3 Blake Street, North Perth, extension to existing telecommunications tower. Can I please have a mover and a seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, through you to the Director of Development Services, if you could just please, um, for the benefit of the, um, the members of the gallery, um, please run us through the answers to some of the questions we've received via email in relation to um, proximity to the boundary impacting on the ability to develop a site in future um, and uh, the approval process that was um, historic and um, also um, in terms of um, the current um, considerations um, that are uh, the area of um, that council is able to focus its decision on in relation to this um, particular item. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. In relation to um, the impact of the development on of, of the tower on the ability for adjoining properties to develop, to develop there isn't any impact. Um, the close proximity of this tower to the adjoining properties um, does not impact on their ability to develop. 
uh, in relation to um, future proposals um, for additional height of this tower. Each application needs to be assessed on its merits. Um, we, the city does not have a position on what an optimal height would be or wouldn't be of the tower. It, each application needs to be assessed on its merits depending on the circumstances of that application. So um, council is required to consider any proposal on its merits at the time that it's lodged. Um, in relation to the history of the application, um, as I mentioned last week, at the time the tower was, um, was constructed in um, 1997, Oh, sorry, 1995, um, the mid-1990s, uh, 1995, 1996. The, um, the existing legislation was the Commonwealth Telecommunications Act, 1991, um, and that exempt, exempted um, proposed telecommunication facilities such as this from state and local planning requirements and, and planning legislation. Um, and so in this circumstance, we have um, the... Uh, supporting documentation around what, what occurred at the time back in the mid-1990s um, when at the time that that legislation applied um, it was exempt from the planning um, legislation but local governments were required to be consulted with on any proposal and so um, each time a proposal was made for that tower council was consulted with and the council did make a decision on that consultation. Um, there was, in those council reports, it states that there was um, advertising to the adjoining properties um, for 14 days, um, and that was in 1996 and um, 1995. Um, and ultimately, council um, reluctantly, these were the words used in the council resolution, reluctantly um, supported the proposal um, after some lengthy discussions with um, the telecommunication provider and an appeal which was made to um, the federal body who controlled um, telecommunication infrastructure at the time. So as a result, the tower was built um, under that legislation um, and didn't require a planning approval. Um, in relation to further um, extensions to the tower, um, if they comply with um, the current legislation, which doesn't exempt um, this kind of a facility from the need for planning approval. So a new facility such as this would now require planning approval under the current legislation now that the, um, the Commonwealth legislation has changed. Um, obviously this extension um, isn't exempt as well and so it does require planning approval. Um, there would be certain um, low impact additions that wouldn't require approval. Um, however, um, the majority of changes to this um, monopole um, extensions in height in particular would require approval now, uh, would require development approval. Um, but the details of that are set out in the telecommunication low impact facilities determination, um, which I understand Mr. Mr. Gell's um, seen and, and has probably read and understood. So um, hopefully that answers um, the questions that have been asked. And can I just ask in relation to the petition that's been received, um, at what their um wording was it, the exact, it, or relating to the position? Um, a petition was received at 3.30pm this afternoon. It was sent directly to me um, and I sent that on then to um, Tim Evans and to the current two directors of development services. Um, it's basically un slightly unclear to me because there is a lengthy submission um, that that sort of came as part of that, and then there is a petition that simply states. Can I, sorry, yeah, see, I know if I just have a quick look. States that the um, petition petition from local residents and businesses opposing the extension and upgrade of the telecommunications facility on Blake Street, North Perth. So it just says that they are opposing, but then the the lead petitioner also s provided the submission which I sent on to council members um, earlier today as well, in which. Um, the lead petitioner raises a number of concerns over unanswered questions, um, approvals for the existing extension, um, where they, where they were, where and when they were approved, and um, some questions around what the lead petitioner believes to be non-compliances and visual degradation, and then goes on to ask a series of nine specific questions. 
So um, earlier today I did ask the director whether it would be possible to answer all of those questions in time for this evening's meeting and the director felt that that wasn't sufficient time. Um, I did raise the fact that even um, in light of the fact that there is um, feelings of unanswered questions that have been washed under the carpet for many years to quote that it might be in the interest of the council and um, the city to actually defer this item and to go through the questions in detail and to try to put together a timeline of approvals and events that led to this um, particular tower and its extensions and also to answer questions such as if the height was approved would the addition of an additional antenna, antenna for example which does create bulk require development approval. So there are a number of sort of outstanding questions that have flowed from the receipt of this um, late petition and submission. I hope that helps. Um, look, from, from my perspective, I agree. I, I think um, that I, I would appreciate to having the opportunity to consider um, the, and address the concerns that have been raised by the community. Um, on the basis of what's before us, I think that we're seeing what we're being asked to consider is a, a, about a 15 per cent increase in the height of uh, the tower. Um, however, um, from a visual amenity point of view, um, I feel that some of the um, changes to the design of the tower, notably removing some of the infrastructure that currently sits at about 14 metres, actually minimises the visual impact of the tower. Um, it looks more streamlined and, and less cluttered, if that's it's probably um, certainly not a technical term. Um, but uh, I would um, uh, will listen to um, other council members' opinions in, in terms of considering the deferral. Councillor Lowden. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess in light of the, the additional information with the petition, I, I, it, that would, to me, appear to warrant some further consideration by administration to provide answers to those questions. Um, similar to Councillor Gontoshevsky, I, I tend to agree on the, the visual amenity side of things, that particularly that removal of the lower uh, pieces and uh, that sort of uh, grouping up of the antenna that is added onto the top, it does um, mitigate that a visual amenity issue that is raised, um, but similarly, I, I would um, be supportive of a deferral if it was moved, and allow others to speak first. Council members, Councillor Tubbleberg. Thank you. Just questions for you to the director. Um, so, th from my understanding, the questions relating to the petition seek to ascertain whether the approval for the existing tower is actually in place. Uh, just two questions. One is, in the event that we were to approve anything tonight, would that mean that if the original, if there was issue, are issues with the existing tower and original approvals, that would be irrelevant because they would then have an approval for uh, for the existing tower or for the tower to be uh, extended? So, if, if there's an approval of something tonight, does that uh, how does that relate to any initial approval? Um, and secondly. Actually, I'll, I'll wait for the answer to that question. Through you, Mayor Cole, as I mentioned earlier, our investigations and, and the Council decisions and reports in 1996 and 1995 have made it clear that there was no need for a planning approval or development approval at the time for those towers, for that tower, sorry. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. I think if there was an addition to an existing non-compliant structure that required planning approval, that wouldn't um, negate that existing non-compliance. So if there was a breach, then the breach would continue um, even if an addition was approved to that breach, provided it was very clear that it's just the addition that is being approved and not the whole structure, including the addition. Okay, so based on that, I'll just, uh, my preference is to deal with the matter tonight because I don't think from a planning point of view that the decision on the questions that are being sought and the information that is being sought doesn't have any bearing on what's being applied for and the decision that we have to make. So from, from my point of view, I'm happy to make the decision this evening. Councillors? Um, look, I will, I will speak. Um, 
obviously I'm not able to move a deferral motion, but my, the issue that I have is that late this afternoon we have received a series of questions, and I understand that not all of this goes to the planning approval, but I think the history um, around this is that the community feels that there has been a lack of um, understanding of how the tower was originally approved, whose responsibility it was, what, is, what does the planning approval give approval for, Personally, I have questions around if the height is approved, does that then allow the carrier to add additional antenna, which is what we're discussing as the bulk, to that height without seeking a further development approval? Um, and I think that given that there is that lack of understanding of the history and clarity around that in the community and that we've received a petition just this afternoon of... 40 plus signatures and I understand from the lead <coughs> petitioner that there were additional signatures but that they were not able to be presented because the people that had the petitions were not getting home from work in time for this evening's meeting. Um, I just feel that from, a pos from the pos um, position of actually informing the community, being very clear about the history in the report through a time timeline and actually answering those questions and providing that information, being very clear about what it is that Council is being asked to approve as part of this particular DA as opposed to what's happened in the past, I think it's worthwhile deferring and being able to outline that and respond to the petition and the questions in a further report to Council which could come next month. Can I ask a question through you, Madam Chair? Sure. The recommendation before us says that the approval would be uh, to extend the telecommunications tower in accordance with the plan shown in attachment two, does that not mean that anything other than what's shown in, in the plans on attachment two would not would be in breach of the planning approval, such that nothing else could be added to it <coughs> if we were to approve it this evening? Through you, Mayor Cole, the the recommendation it clearly just relates to the extension that's proposed. It doesn't mean anything else is in breach. It just it just means that. So, sorry, the question. So, what's shown on there in terms of the antenna and the I don't know the technical term for the devices that are, that are shown. Well, they, there are antenna, antenna, antennae. So they are shown to be some to be removed and some to be added. The recommendation, as I read, it says that it's to approve in accordance with the plans shown. So anything other than the install new Optus GPS antenna, uh, refer to GPS antenna notes, blah blah, and the removal of the other anything other than that would not be in line with. The approval if we were to approve as recommended. Is that correct? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Through you, Chair. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I note that the community consultation occurred um, back in February through to March, <clears throat> so quite a long time ago. I'm just um, wanting to find out is there anything that has occurred in the last few weeks that has prompted the um, petition on the basically on the eve of the decision. Is there some activity that uh, council haven't been made aware of? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. It's I, I would suspect that as a result of the report being finalised um, and all of the um, submitters, as well as all the residents that were advertised to originally being sent a letter advising them that the report was available on the website and will be presented to the council briefing last week in the council meeting tonight that, that as a result um, the the submitters and those that were um, advertised to originally reviewed the report um, and has subsequently raised their concerns so I suspect that that's what's occurred nothing else as far as I'm aware has occurred other than that councillors any further comment Councillor Hallett. Are we aware, I'm um, sorry, through the Mayor to you, Director of uh, Development Services, are we aware of any implications for the applicant? If, if it was to be deferred, what does that mean? Um, and also, um, sorry if this has been um, addressed in one of those emails. It, in terms of the, the use um, and approval, how long into the future does this kind of apply? Can it, you say, five years' time from now, can we decide that um, this is not the spot that we want a telecommunications tower? Yes, Sri Mayor Cole, the, the, the tower was constructed at the time uh, it was exempt from the need for planning approval um, and so there is no limit to how long the tower can exist in that location um, on that basis. Um, in relation to the impact it, that a deferral would have on the um, applicant, um, the application is now um, 
it's just fallen outside of the 90-day um, statutory time frame. Um, and so the applicant would have the right to have this, um, uh, well, the fact that it's gone outside that statutory time frame, um, it's considered to be deemed refused. And so the applicant would have the right to have that deemed refusal um, considered by, by SAT and have a, and, and lodge an appeal with SAT on that basis. Um, so that's probably the, you know, that's the option that they have. Um, they have that option now and they also would have that option if the matter was deferred. Follow up. Um, and so that would incur then legal fees for us to deal with that. Um, and, is, and presumably the, apart from, I guess, alleviating some of the, the questions for community members, the, the actual decision won't um, be affected by filling out some of that information. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, there wouldn't be any legal fees associated with that at this stage. So if the applicant um, lodged an appeal with SAT, um, we wouldn't engage lawyers at this early point. Um, it would be referred to a directions hearing, administration's officers would attend, um, and in all likelihood, we would um, ask for the opportunity for council to consider the additional information if council um, deferred the item and requested additional information, um, and for council to have the opportunity to make a decision. There'd be no costs associated with that other than administration time um, to do that. Councillors, any further comments? There being no deferral motion, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried. Okay, we'll go to item 9.1, number 110 Elmer Road, North Perth, proposed dwelling. Moved Council Toplerberg, seconded Council Gonczewski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So um, I have a couple of questions in relation to this, and then I'll make some comments. Um, I understand... Actually, I'm going to ask the CEO a question, if I may, firstly. <laughs> so just a question through you to the CEO. Uh, I understand that the uh, briefing notes that we are provided are provided for council members only, but if I have a question that specifically relates, relates to information provided in the briefing notes, am I free to discuss them or to quote them in this forum? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yeah, I absolutely have no issue with that. But also, if, um, if you go back to the origins of the council briefing when it was first established and the, um, the rules surrounding that that council adopted, um, it, um, it provides that um, the CEO can release um, the information contained in the briefing notes um, based on a request from someone who's affected by the proposal. But in any event, um, the briefing notes just serve as a bit of a log of questions and requests for additional information that council members publicly raised at the council briefing last week. Um, if that information was available to administration, I know it would have been presented back to council last week um, at the briefing session, so I have no issue or, or concern with that. All right, so my question uh, relates to landscaping. So I'll just read the comments in relation to, um, that were provided in relation to, so effectively the plans as drawn uh, or as provided, and so particularly the landscaping plan, which uh, is on page 26 of the, uh, well, from 26 and 27 of the agenda. So talks that the ca total canopy coverage shown is 37.29%, and it shows 9.29% falling outside of the property boundary and 13% falling within the bu building envelope. So just for my clarity and apologies, I didn't come back to you uh, offline, I suppose, on, on this, but that means that uh, roughly 23% or 22.3% in total, so effectively 23% of it is either outside the property or shown as overlapping the building, that's not 23% of the 37%. It's of the 30 OK, so it's effectively give or take half of the landscaping, OK? Um, so the next bit, so the, the officers have assessed the tree species uh, wouldn't be appropriate. And so the planning condition that's there that basically says you have to meet the minimum 37.29% plus, uh, um, plus the deep soil zones. Uh, but we're saying uh, that ensuring that the lands deliver the, uh, 
The city identified a variety of other species would be appropriate and would deliver more than that by growing up and over the development and spreading out appropriately above the, above the right of way. So the right of way thing I don't have an issue with or I just have a, a bit of a misunderstanding about what the intent is and where, where the trees are and what species and how they would look that are supposed to be planted either in deep soil zones or on the second storey to grow beyond the third storey to provide that canopy coverage and what that then means for this property and for, other, and for others in terms of, because I guess we're looking at things being planted at three metres that are supposed to grow another seven metres high and then have their canopy. Um, I don't know where they're going to put the soil to be able to grow those within the development. Can I just get an explanation of that, please? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. The, the trees that are proposed on the first floor aren't um, appropriate species for that location. They won't grow to the, to the height that the canopy diagram has shown um, and they would need um, significant um, deep soil to be able to grow in the way that they've shown. So smaller species are appropriate in that location and they will cover appropriately, there, there are species, lots of species available that would cover that um, area, so provide canopy over that area, but wouldn't grow up above the building. So those internal, those internal courtyards won't have large trees growing up and above the building. Um, the area where there is a significant opportunity to provide the canopy coverage, which has been identified by the city's technical officers, is that eastern side where those three trees are shown. At the moment, the very small trees are shown in that location, um, but there is um, lots of species that are much larger that could be um, grown within that deep soil space and they would grow out over the, the right of way and potentially up and above the building. Um, so that's where um, the, deep, the opportunity for the canopy coverage comes from and that's where the technical officers have come to the conclusion that the 37.29% um, can be delivered quite comfortably with the deep soil zone configuration of that development. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Um, Oh, this has been a very difficult one. I love the concept. I like the. I have no issue with the principle of the height in this location. Uh, I think that it, the site. I think it's a clever design, generally speaking, in terms of making use of a site that, uh, whilst not currently, will absolutely be impacted by the development that local planning strategy two allows on Fitzgerald Street. Um, and I think that it has the. Uh, whilst it has gone over the um, allowable height and hasn't completely contained itself within a pitched roof, um, it does, the, the design principle allows, uh, I think is sensitive to the area, broadly speaking. I do have significant issues with the actual design outcome that, that's been proposed. Uh, I've tried to separate my personal aversion to the proposed screens on the, uh, on the eastern side uh, from that, but in general I think that Effectively, we have a we have uh, we have a discretionary scheme, and effectively, what we say is do something brilliant, and you have the potential to be able to uh, to seek discretion to to allow something uh, that is uh, different. I think that the the final design outcome that's been proposed here, uh, for me, doesn't justify the overall height uh, that is proposed. I think that the design needs to be better in order to, as I say, I don't have a a problem with the principle of the height, but. Um, I will listen eagerly to the debate, but uh, I, just, I generally don't think that it is, sits well enough within the landscape and within the surrounding properties to be able to be approvable in its current form, but I'll happily listen to the debate. Thank you, Mayor. Um, look, I've, uh, I guess, struggled with this one as well. I think, you know, we, we have a total site area of 180 square metres, um, in a zone, residential zone directly adjoining the district centre. Number of variations, some are smaller in terms of pier width, boundary wall height, garage setbacks and open space, but um, bigger variations in terms of the additional storey, the wall height and overall building height. Um, whilst in, there's sort of a temptation to, um, you know, rigidly adhere to some of the principles that in, in the, or the statements in um, our uh, built form policy and, and we've got a newly minted LPS. Um, I, um, 
I think we do need to consider the context of the site in relation to the town centre and also the constraints in relation to the small site. Um, I think the wall height is probably the most impactful thing that we're considering here um, as um, the design has worked to conceal much of the third storey within the roof. Um, and look, from my perspective, the development incorporates you know, a range of materials. I, I also am somewhat dubious about screening, but in terms of the broad principle, in terms of minimising bulk um, and you know, by breaking down the design, it, we've got it separated into two components. We've got a range of materials, um, and we've got a use of materials that are reflective of the surrounding area. Um, we note that the design is compliant from an overshadowing perspective. Um, and I, I guess in relation to overshadowing, um, I just wanted to get uh, ask a question to the Director of Development Services. Um, we've looked at the overshadowing in relation to the... Um, Raglan Road properties, um, but just a comment in relation to um, overshadowing in relation to um, uh, Ethel Street properties um, in terms of um, the, not necessarily the, the impact of the height, but, um, but whether they, um, both the building and I guess also any um, significant plantings um, on that eastern side um, would um, and the impact they may have on those properties on Ethel Street. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, the, the R codes assesses overshadowing, so the technical assessment of overshadowing is done on the 21st of June at midday. Um, so that's the overshadowing diagrams that have been provided to, to Council. Um, obviously, an additional, um, the additional height will um, lead to overshadowing of the eastern and western properties um, in the afternoon and morning, um, additional overshadowing. In fact, the development itself will lead to overshadowing over and above what um, currently exists, which is a vacant block. The additional height itself, um, I think it's, it's demonstrated in those drawings, doesn't lead to significant additional overshadowing. So a compliant two-storey dwelling with a pitched roof of nine metres um, compared to this development which are, with a pitched roof of 10.1 um, wouldn't lead to significant additional overshadowing. It's about one and a half metres mm -hmm. of additional overshadowing. Um, and if it was compliant, if the setbacks were compliant, it would probably be closer to the boundaries of the right of way. And so um, it would probably be even less of an additional um, amount of overshadowing in the mornings or afternoons depending on which property we're, um, we're talking about. So um, under the R codes it is compliant because it's only assessed at, at noon. Um, so uh, it is compliant with those properties as well and the difference wouldn't be significant. Thank you. Um, look, I think from my perspective, um, it's a very close call. I will listen to the debate, but I think if we have some um, significant plantings on the eastern elevation, or eastern side of the property, that will further um, minimise the impact of the design and I, I, I don't see, um, I feel that the, the design or, and, the, and the, the comments in, in the report and the applicant's response has indicated that there has been a consideration of the um, design principles um, in this um, application in relation to um, using different materials and, and the, the way that the, um, the building has been separated. So um, I, at this stage, I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. Councillors, Councillor Harley. Um, through you, um, Director, are you able to let Council know what the back of that block was prior to this, the um, DA being put in, please? Through you, Mayor Cole, I'm, I can't um, provide definitive information on that um, other than to say I believe it was rear yard, um, but I, I haven't looked at that history and I don't have um, the intra -map mapping system to confirm that. So other than the Google Maps seems to show it as rear yard. <coughs> Um, well, we'll come back to you because we've just asked a question, so you can come back in at any time. Um, any further comments from other councils on this um, development 
application, Council for Tarkas. Um, like the other councillors, I um, I looked at this uh, application. I looked at uh, what was being proposed on the site, um, the difficulty um, of dealing with that site, and we often talk about um, discretion being allowed in instances of design excellence or how we might be able to encourage um, excellence in design. I don't think we've quite got there with this particular application. Um, and I've listened to what other councillors have said. Um, I still have concerns about um, the canopy cover and through you, Mayor Cole, I'd like to um, ask the Director of Planning Understanding the tree selection for this and we're forward thinking to sometime in the future being able to meet those canopy targets with um, the mature growth. What needs to be undertaken in terms of maintenance of those tree species um, to ensure that that actually occurs and um, what are the I suppose the rights of uh, of councillor. What um, um, you know? Do we have to actually ensure that the correct maintenance and care of those uh, those uh, trees are actually done to achieve what we're you know maybe approving? Um, you know, currently, if you if you understand what I mean. Through you, Mayor Cole, condition, the condition of approval in relation to landscaping condition two does require a landscaping plan which shows the canopy coverage, the 37.29% canopy coverage, um, and reticulation, irrigation of those, of those plants um, in, a, in a manner that would ensure that they would succeed. Um, if those plants fail, sorry, that, the, that landscaping plan is then required to be implemented by um, the developer and the owner is required to maintain um, that landscaping thereafter. So if one of those trees dies, um, or isn't establishing in the appropriate manner in accordance with that landscaping plan because of um, a lack of irrigation, for instance, the owner would be required to um, replace that tree or in, in, uh, install or correct the, the irrigation to ensure that the landscaping um, has been installed and is being maintained in accordance with the plan. So um, it is part of the planning approval that has been recommended um, and would be enforceable through the Planning and Development Act. Um, through you, Mick Holt, does that also include um, required maintenance to get tree species to that height? No? Through you, Mayor Cole, the condition doesn't specifically require the tree to grow in a particular way. Um, it simply states that certain types of trees should be planted and that they need to be irrigated and, and maintained in accordance with the landscaping plan. It doesn't require um, the growth to be um, of a particular amount each year or for the tree to reach a particular height, that's dictated through the species of trees selected and the irrigation um, required. I suppose what I'm meaning more is um, pruning required to actually encourage that growth and ensure tree health that way, not just through um, irrigation. Yes, through Mayor Cole, that's, um, that's not specifically included in the condition currently in relation to pruning. And nor could I provide any comment on whether pruning of particular species would encourage growth or deliver a particular outcome. Um, that's not to say the landscaping plan couldn't address that issue if the species of tree warranted it. Um, in fact, if the species of tree warranted pruning for a particular reason, then that certainly would form part of it, but it will depend on the species of tree. Councillors, Councillor Harley. I don't think my voice yeah. will stay. It's got it this time. Um, I've got, um, I guess, a couple of questions in regards to trees in the backs of yards. What does the city do to monitor compliance, development, growth of the tree, irrigation, etc., over the course of 12 months, 18 months, two years? Through you, Mayor Cole, the city does not proactively um, review. Um, landscaping that's been installed. Um, we review the landscaping when it's installed to ensure that in, the irrigation is installed, the correct tree species have been installed. Uh, that occurs when the, the occupancy permit is um, issued uh, around that time, before or after. Um, but we don't monitor the trees um, subsequently unless there's a, a concern raised um, by a community member, um, in which case we will investigate, uh, determine 
what kinds of trees are out there, um, what the level of growth is, um, and whether the irrigation is there, whether the landscaping plan has been complied with, and, and take action if there are any um, inconsistencies with the landscaping plan. Can I just one more question on that, just for future reference? Have you had a situation where um, a tree where we've required to be in the back part of a property with to achieve particular canopy cover where it's been reported to you that it hasn't been compliant, the tree's been removed or died or something like that? Yes, Sri Mayor Cole, we have had circumstances where that's occurred um, and yeah, we've taken uh, action as we normally would with any breach of an approval. Um, through you, Mayor, I'm um, actually in support of this application and um, I, I do acknowledge the um, some of the concerns that, that have been have that have been raised in regards to the canopy, and also with some of the um, materials, and you know whether whether there could have been a bit more effort made in regards to that would have been a good thing. But thinking about this site in and this street and in this location, and the building that has been renovated and in fact saved because it's on the municipal heritage list, but it's category B. Um, the owner could have applied to demolish it. Um, and I do remember when it came on the market um, for sale, there's a lot of interest in what was going to happen, whether it would be demolished um, or whether somebody who loved um, a heritage-style building would come and do exactly what this um, applicant has done. Um, and I, the, the backyard um, area, um, to, to the best of my memory, and I actually had a look in that particular um, property many, many years ago, um, was a pretty um, underutilised yard. Um, there was a gate there where cars could park in. There were no trees um, of my memory um, to that. I couldn't find any on the maps when I looked last week, but the maps may have been um, old. So, you know, Mary Street is a... is um, The whole street is covered in trees. I mean, you just simply can't get any sunlight on it most days. Um, some would say there's too many trees down there um, creating problems, but it's also um, in exactly the type of area where we'd be wanting to um, encourage this type of development. So I'm really pleased that the um, applicant um, has gone down this pathway rather than demolition and renewal. Um, it's obviously within a few minutes walk to um, the very beautiful Hyde Park. It's within a few minutes walk to um, Beaufort Street, Mary Street, Highgate. Sorry, I'm on the wrong item. <laughs> um, yes, we're talking about 101 Sorry. Elmer Road. I was following the agenda and I'm on item 9.4. My yep. apologies. Okay. I'll we come back to my notes when we get to okay. that. Okay, all right. Would, uh, would anyone else like to speak to item 9.1? Okay, look, I'll make a few comments. Um, look, there are obviously some issues around the height. Um, there have been issues raised by um, the, uh, a resident that um, potentially goes to this issue of the eastern side and the uh, high, um, high wall. Um, I, I tend to um, think that some of the comments that Councillor Harley was making about um, <laughs> Mary Street actually do apply. I thought that you were talking about this item yeah. because they are thoughts that I was having around Very the fact similar. that this is actually a quite a good location for a development with some additional height that it does <coughs> directly abut um, the rear of Fitzgerald Street, which will be six storeys under, well, it now has the potential to grow to six storeys in time under LPS2. Um, in terms of the height itself, the difference between a pitched roof at two storeys versus what this is at three storeys with it being partly concealed is 1.1 metre. And where the, there is that additional height to the wall, I do think that while it might not be to, um, you know, design, you know, the articulation in terms of perhaps there could have been uh, less reliance on screening, etc. But in terms of the, as Councillor Gondoszewski has mentioned, the, the variation in materials, the fact that um, there's some attempt to make the screen look interesting, uh, that the fact that there will be the trees planted along this um, elevation and that there is a single carport, not a double. Um, and it does appear to be the case that this has been built in the backyard of a original home which has been retained, whether it's 
probably not on the MHI though, but um, <laughs> it is a similar set of circumstances. In that regard, it's also wholly <laughs> surrounded by rights of way, so it is set back um, on all angles from by being surrounded by um, rights of way. So I don't feel that there's sufficient grounds there on, on, in relation to, to the design to say no to the variation, which I do think is fitting in this particular location, being so proximate to um, to the um, Fitzgerald Street and the district centre. So um, my inclination is to support um, the development. Are there any further questions or, or comments before I put it? All those in favour? All those against? I declare it carried with Councillor Toppleberg voting against. Okay. Um, we are now moving on to item 9.5. 9.4 was carried on block. Um, so that's Double whammy. <laughs> <laughs> I should have stayed in bed. So um, we're looking at item 9.5, <coughs> which is 131 oh. Coogee Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed awning to single house. And just to note that there is an alternate recommendation on the table. Do I have a mover for the, um, for the, the motion? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I support the officer recommendation. Uh, let me get uh, to it again. Um, so, to me, this is. Uh, let me just get to it exactly. Um, so, for me, we have. Uh, just let me confirm. We are on item nine point five, aren't we? Yes, that is okay. correct. I'm just confirming because that's not what was up there before, and I was okay. So um, through uh, anomalies in the planning framework and through perseverance, and I have no issue. I have no issue with the applicant pursuing what is allowed to them, but I feel as though the streetscape generally, but this property in particular, has been significantly compromised through uh, the. Uh, desire of the applicant to end up with an outcome that is not in keeping with the rest of the, the street. And there is nothing about the drawings that I have in front of me that suggests, and it's not materials and finishes for me, there's nothing about it that suggests that it's going to do anything other than further impact uh, in that way. I don't disagree that they have, are completely entitled to, uh, with no DA to remove the existing awning that's there. I uh, make no comment about um, the, the existing awning uh, and its condition, because I'm not aware of it. But what's before us and what's being applied for, to me, uh, there is, uh, as I say, I support the officer recommendation. I think that uh, what's contained in there uh, provides fair reasons for uh, refusal. And I know there is an alternative, but I'm comfortable with the officer recommendation. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, look, I know that SAT made reference to this awning. I think that was in the context of the determination around the carport. But, um, um, uh, but I don't feel that um, the reasons for refusal are... Um, I, can't, I can't stand by the reasons for refusal. I don't necessarily feel that they're um, def defendable in that regard. I, I, I think that um, the removal of the awning... Um, is at the owner's discretion. Um, and I think that the materials can be addressed with a condition. So um, I would be supportive of an alternative should this motion fail. Councillors? Councillor Lowden? Um, I guess the, the two issues um, that I see with this proposal is the, the visual amenity aspect of the um, the design and the materials that are used. Um, at this specific site, there is a slight hill um, that goes down as it is in Mount Hawthorne. We are on a slight mount. Um, and quite a significant tree on the uh, northern side, which is directly in front of this, um, uh, where this uh, um, awning is proposed. Uh, so from the streetscape, unless you're physically standing right on the um, on the fence, uh, it won't be visible anyway. So I feel like that addresses a lot of the visual amenity part of that. 
and um, I similarly would agree with Councillor Gonczeszewski that this can be addressed with a condition around materials and consistency of materials to deal with the, the inconsistency there. Councillors, any further comments on the motion before you? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the motion? Thank you. Two in favour and all those against? I declare the motion lost. Yes, Councillor Murphy, you wish to move an alternate recommendation? I'm happy to move the alternative as written on the white, 9.5, to approve uh, with a width not exceeding 4.1 metres. It's got that. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Lowden. Councillor Murphy, do you wish to speak to the alternate recommendation? No, thanks. Councillor Lowden. Councillor Hallett, did you wish to speak? No? Okay. Anyone? No? Okay. I'm putting the alternate recommendation. All those in favour? All those against? Thank you. I declare it carried. So that was our planning items for the evening. Um, we're now moving on to engineering. So we have item 10.1, review of engineering policies relating to verge treatments and street trees. Can I have a mover for this item? Moved, Councillor Toppelberg, seconded, Councillor Lowden. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to bring this up because it has changed significantly since the, um, since the briefing and just to acknowledge the efforts uh, of the administration to uh, make those changes between um, between last week and this week, and I think it captures much of what we're, we're talking about. I will um, just note that we do we have had in the current year um, in amongst uh, our listed priorities the uh, principle of having one verge tree per residential dwelling or per residential lot at the street front, and I understand uh, Mr Murphy's response last week in that there are issues where the owner specifically doesn't want it about potential vandalism or otherwise, but I do think that uh, certainly the introduction to the policy, whilst it doesn't hold any weight in itself, is a better reflection of um, how we broadly as Vincent, not just council and staff, but how the community feel about trees and the role that they play, uh, and verge trees in particular, and the role that they play in the public realm, but also delivering uh, key benefits to community, uh, none the least of which is significant increase in property value. So. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pull it out rather than letting it go through on block because I think that it's um, it, it far better captures how uh, how we see our verges, our verge trees, and what we're encouraging people to do and not do uh, in those spaces. Well, Toppleberg, Councillor Lowden. Thank you, and thank you for pulling it out because I had an amendment and I forgot to pull it out. Um, I'm similarly supportive of this, and I, I think it's a great uh, step forward for the city um, to make this process a lot simpler, enable people to do these activities on their verges. Um, my only uh, addition, and I've had some discussion with the Director of Engineering about this, is just to um, have a catch-all statement in around enabling um, other stuff that's not specifically listed to be approved, like garden gnomes or um, other fixed structures that people want to put on their verge. Uh, so. I'll I'll uh, put forward the amendment if I can get a seconder. Is there a seconder? Councillor Castle is seconding. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's fairly straightforward just for the hanging off stuff off trees um, or uh, sticking stuff in your verge and enabling uh, the Director of Engineering to approve other items that are appropriate for this so that we don't end up having to come back and amend it because, for example, um, there are... Uh, little libraries that have been set up by Transition Town, which are not listed on this, but are dotted in all around the place and a number of them are placed in verges. Uh, so making sure that those things or any other new initiatives that we would like to see people putting into their verges or hanging, enabling people to hang on their trees, they can do that as well. 
Um, sorry, Councillor Castle, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Uh, I'm supportive of this amendment. I think that um, for the reasons that Councillor Lowden's outlined, but also because I help, it helps to move us towards a more streamlined process for this and um, be more permissive rather than uh, tying things up in approval. So um, I will be supporting this. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Just a question through you to the director. Um, first of all, should it be delegating the authority to the Director of Engineering or to the City? And secondly, in the absence of an explanation, because we'd spent the last week pulling out everywhere where it said approval, in the absence of an explanation of what an approval process or an application process would entail, do we need a clause that specifies how somebody would seek that approval? Uh, is it put it up there and wait for someone to complain? Is it send an email? Is it make a phone call? Is it fill out a form? Um, through you, Macole. Um We chose not to put a specific approval process in, so I think the simple answer is all of the above. If we become aware of something, somebody contacts us, it just gives the, the person that sits in the Director of Engineering's position the ability to approve it. So the library is a good example. It's very difficult to list everything that could possibly um, be put on a verge. We've, we've done our best with the main things, so that is the catch hole. So the answer to the question is all of the above. You know, There isn't a specific approval process, but we'll, uh, we'll deal with it as they arise. And just to the first question, does should it be the Director of Engineering or the City that has the authority to approve? Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm happy to answer that. I think it's just important to note that the the general statutory presumption is against these things from um, being permitted within verges and attached to street trees. Um, through this policy, Council is obviously prescribing um, things that are permissible and adding to that list. I think it is actually quite appropriate in this context for the policy to reference the Director Engineering. If it just ubiquitously refers to the city, then that can be uh, misinterpreted and translated in different ways. So it might be that um, you know, someone at a different level of the organisation who perhaps um, shouldn't be making that decision is then making that decision. Um, in any event, I think it's open to being tested. Um, as part of the advertising of these draft provisions and so I would say that if we do get any feedback from the community as to how these arrangements might operate, it provides Council with the option to finesse some of the wording or bolster up those things um, when it subsequently considers the policy for adoption or determination after advertising. Councillors, any further questions or comments on the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments in relation to the substantive motion? Okay, I can't help myself. I have to say, if we remember back in December 2017, <coughs> when we featured in the Daily Mail online for removal of a verge tree swing in North Perth. This was pretty crushing and embarrassing for a council that is progressive and in tune with its community. It showed that although we had had these sorts of things happening on our verges in our street trees, that we were in fact giving awards for beautiful verges that had rocks and logs and crocodile seats, that we were not reflecting what was happening in our community, something that we love, something that our community loves, something that actually brings people and children together out in the street, um, and that our rule book did not reflect what was something that we wanted to embrace and encourage in the City of Vincent. So while it has taken a little bit longer than I would have hoped to go through the process with our insurer LGIS, I think we've come to a, a policy that I'm really very proud to take out to the community for advertising that basically says we want to be able to say yes, we don't want to tie you up in approval processes. If it's good and safe and it's not hurting the tree, then go ahead, make the most of your verge, enjoy it, play on it, grow on it have fun with it and that is for me is about local government stepping back and saying yes which is uh, what we are really wanting to see more of so I'm really proud to take this out to the community and hopefully the community will be um, happy to see this uh, now reflected in, um, in the removal of rules and processes that, that really wasn't doing anyone any great favours. So very happy to support this. Are there any further comments? Okay I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously.
Okay, on to item 10.2, proposed traffic management and safety improvement, Edinburgh Street, Mount Hawthorne. Do I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved, Councillor Castle. Seconded, Councillor Gonshevsky. Uh, thank you, through you, Mayor Cole. I, I am supportive partially of this uh, motion, in particular the um, approval in relation to the speed humps around Edinburgh Street Reserve. Um, however, I have some concerns about not approving any treatments at the intersection of Edinburgh and Ellesmere. Um, we had quite a, con uh, quite a considerable conversation with many of the residents in that area and uh, the consultation, I think, although not in favour of some options, uh, has borne out that we need to address the, um, the speed issue and the bus the buses, the heavy traffic that's coming down that that road. Um, I have some concerns with the fact that we went out to consultation and uh, on a proposal that we were then not prepared to actually implement. Um, but I, I, on that basis, I would look to move an amendment, but I'm happy for other people to talk first if they would like to. I just wish to clarify, there has been a bit of a misunderstanding. So there are two alternative recommendations um, before you uh, on the table sorry. for consideration. Um, unfortunately, one was a proposed amendment, but given that it's the opposite of what is being proposed by um, administration, both um, are actually alternative um, recommendations. Okay. So should we continue yes. where no, we are going with this for now? Um, Councillor Loden, Councillor Gonshevsky. I find this one a vexing one as well. Um, I think when we've considered traffic calming measures in the past, we, we certainly see that um, the community um, has uh, concerns about vehicle numbers and speed on their streets and the impact both from a safety perspective but also from a livability perspective. I think that the city in going out to com and having a conversation with the community on this and looking at the options, um, they've, they've certainly is some options that could have been pursued but were outside of local government reach. Um, I think just as, as an aside, but it obviously relates, I, I would really like to get to a point where, much like we've sort of reached with some of our considerations around parking, um, where we actually work towards the development of some sort of standard to, to determine our assessment and intervention in these circumstances that perhaps allows us to look at the evidence and, um, but also, you know, assess that against um, community concern. but have some sort of a, um, a guide, you know, a, a, a different sort of guide to decision making, uh, uh, like, like, much as we've done with our, our parking. Um, because I guess I, I try and look at the objective evidence and, um, you know, I note that as an access road, this, these, this road's operating within speed and volume criteria. Um, and the, the report notes that the data does not support the need for traffic calming. Um, however, I can appreciate taking an extra cautious approach in close proximity to playgrounds that you may not necessarily take in relation to speed in other sections of the street. Um, so I, I'm supportive of the um, recommendation in this instance. I um, would need to hear some um, more... I would need to, to understand a little bit more in relation to... Um, the community concerns um, in, in terms of supporting any alternative if the recommendation um, does, is not successful. Councillors? Councillor Lowden? Um, a question first. Um, in terms of uh, mitigating speed, if you were to be considering speed bumps or hypothetically either side of an intersection or a raised plateau, which would be more effective or are they effectively the same result in terms of speed? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, a very similar result. Uh, I don't support the, the current officer recommendation and would be supportive of an alternative recommendation. 
uh, to install speed bumps either side of the intersection. Councillors, um, look, I I did prepare two alternatives for council to consider, and then um, we did receive the information further to that. At a, um, I think the day later from engineering, with a bit more information really delving into the comments on the raised plateau, which was received during community consultation. Um, and while the over, overwhelming majority was in favour of the plateau, it did talk about the fact that um, those that are probably most proximate um, did have issues around the plateau. So um, I just wanted to ask the director, the other option was really to look at just two speed humps on Edinburgh Street. So you're literally having two, um, two raised bumps as opposed to a plateau on all sides of the uh, intersection. Would that result in less noise and a potentially more flexibility in placement? So you may call. Um, there should be a plan that's attached to the amendment. I don't think it's actually attached to what's in front of you, but it was emailed showing uh, the proposal for speed humps either side. It's on the back, is it? Ah, oh, that's good, it is there. You can see the speed, hump, um, the speed humps proposed don't um, uh, traverse the road completely. They're on one side or the other. So uh, in terms of noise, again, it's difficult to say there would be a perception if you were to measure the noise, it would be um, different, you know, in terms of perception. Um, so it would be a very similar outcome to the, the plateau. The only thing I would say, the speed up, obviously, there's an up and a down motion, whereas the plateau, the up and the down motion are in a different place. So the, the noise is more concentrated in one location. But just further to that, in terms of the plateau, I assume that you'd have the up and down noise along Elsmere as well as um, Edinburgh, but with the speed humps, you'd have the up and down noise just on Edinburgh. Yeah, that's, that's correct, Nicole. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Um, look, it is a difficult one. We had meetings with residents to talk through this issue in quite some detail. We did talk to them about the data and the fact that it was coming in under 50. Um, we talked about the fact that the, the, the topography of the street has that clear run all the way through from Green down to Woodstock before you hit a, a red... Um, stop sign and that is a um, it is a hill on the decline um, and then in terms of the speed humps around Edinburgh um, Street Reserve that was really about trying to be have some more safety around the park as well as noting that there is a bit of a, um, a, a sort of turn in the street as you approach um, Scarborough Beach Road so I think that in terms of um, UMAG and where we're heading with this and the consideration of these issues we are trying to take a bit more of a holistic approach this one probably came in um, some months before that discussion started and I think that there were some um, expectations raised through the, com the conversations that we've had with, with the um, residents. I think I take Councillor Castle's point that going out and advertising a plateau, we should only really advertise what it is that we're prepared to do. I do think that useful information did come through consultation in that those that were proximate had, had some... Um, some concerns about that, so that that was valuable, but um, it doesn't seem to be the only reason for administration not recommending um, the plateau. Um, so when talking to residents, they talked about the fact that cars are having a clear run down to Woodville, not always stopping there regardless. Um, the upper part of the street is concerned about bus traffic. Um, we have had to refer them to PTA to have that discussion, but that does reflect in the 10... 10% approximate of traffic coming down that top section is probably attributable to Transperth buses, which brings its own issues. Um, the bottom part of the street has less speed than the, than the top part, but does have the park. So um, this, from speaking to the residents, this is an issue that has been going on for some time. I understand particularly from the resident that, present, that represented the top part closer to Green Street that this has been something that the residents have sought from council in terms of traffic calming over a long period of time. There is a history. I believe there was an accident in the street many years ago, um, over 20 years ago, where there was an injury. So it's something that I be believe from speaking to the resident representing that part of the street that has been requests made in the past and they often will turn to Shakespeare Street which is the model of traffic calming and say well we want 
what they have. They understand that while the speed isn't being breached, that they're indicating that 50 is too fast on residential streets and they feel particularly um, aggrieved, I guess, that they also have the bus route, which is great for local transport, but as residents they have vocalised that they're not particularly keen on having um, that volume of, of buses coming down the street. So whilst the data doesn't, doesn't show that there's... Um, you know, speeding above 50 to a point where you'd actually, um, you know, look at getting the police involved or anything like that. I think the residents are saying that they do want a calmer, slower street. Um, I know that we're trying to pursue our 40 kilometre an hour travel speed zone trial and that ultimately that's a way of trying to get speeds on streets to reflect, I think, the community sentiment that's coming through. But that is some time away in terms of seeing that filter across Vincent and I think that we do still need to deal with the residents' um, requests as best we can with the tools that we have before us. So um, I would certainly be in favour of um, having speed humps in both locations. I think the plateau, given that it hasn't been well received by the residents that are most um, impacted, probably isn't the way to go. Um, but I do think that um, my, my, fa my point would be that to not put traffic coming there, I think there would be um, general upset and um, discord in the community given that we've gone out and consulted on a plateau um, and showing some indication through conversation that we are prepared to deal with the topography of the street. Councillor Harley. Through you, Chair. I'm, I'm just wanting to find out about the residents of um, at 88 and 83 in particular. So the four residents who would be most, uh, or the four houses who would be most affected by whether it's a raised platform or speed bumps. Did they respond? Were they involved in consultation and have they voiced a particular view? Because quite often people want a speed bump, they just don't want it in front of their house. So I'm just wanting to know from your Director whether you're aware of their view. Uh, through you, Michael. Uh, we did provide some additional information as part of the follow-up notes from the briefing. And um, um, to summarise, I'm just looking at the information now. The 88 were opposed to the plateau. Um, so were 86. Um, 83, uh, again, were opposed to the plateau. Uh, 85 didn't respond. So you're right. I mean, it, it's uh, fairly normal for the people that are most affected and closest. Although they don't object to traffic calming in general, they do object to the, the structure being outside the house. So that's reflected in this consultation. Through you, Chair. Sorry, just to clarify, um, is that objection to the platform or objection to the speed humps? Again, through you, Michael, that's objection to the plateau. We didn't ask a specific question about the speed humps, the speed humps are an alternative installation. Um, through you, Chair, I'd be really reluctant to be approving um, speed humps, humps outside residents where they've already been opposed to a platform. Um, a lot of people want speed humps until they're outside their house and they realise um, how noisy they are and um, they may calm traffic on the approach and on the um, egress, but they don't, um, they don't reduce noise. Um, in fact, they add to noise on the street. And um, I know there's some people on Anzac Street not happy. They're quite, un my view is they're unsightly and they make our streets um, difficult to navigate around in some cases. I, I'm really surprised that the residents, um, that that street, they feel needs more calming. I regularly go down Edinburgh Street not because I'm rat running, because it is actually the easiest way for me to get home when I'm on when I'm coming from the north and I'm trying to get to my house. And it's incredibly slow. In fact, I find it quite hard if you wanted to to go very fast. And there's always traffic. There's always cars parked on either side of the street. So it's actually quite a narrow street when you drive down when there's cars on both sides. So I, I would be very concerned about us approving. Um, any alternatives that result in speed humps when um, those residents where the speed hump is going to go out the front of have already said no or they've objected to a platform um, and may well end up with speed humps outside their house instead. So not sure how we navigate around that. But. Okay, Councillor, so we're still dealing with the officer recommendation, which is for speed humps by Edinburgh Street Reserve, but for no treatment at the um, Edinburgh and Ellesmere Street um, intersection. Are there any further comments? Councillor Gondoshevsky. 
I know that we're dealing with the substantive, but given that there is a proposed alternative, may I just ask, I note that in the report that there is, um, through you to the Director of uh, Engineering, that the um, proposed speed bumps um, would cost in the order of $6,000 and can be funded from the 2018-19 uh, draft miscellaneous traffic management budget. Um, I presume that um, uh, single side speed humps of the same uh, order of magnitude in terms of cost and um, are there additional costs uh, or, or, or and, um, and is there scope within the miscellaneous traffic budget for additional um, treatments if required? Um, through you, McCall, that, that, that's correct. The, the cost is similar for the speed humps at the top um, near the intersection as near the park, so there's no difference in cost. Uh, there is um, some money left over in the budget this year, so um, we could definitely do um, the, the, the reserve speed humps with the current budget. There is a chance that that budget will be expended, and then on that basis we would do the the, the plateau or the other speed humps out of next year's budget. We're so close to the financial year, we, we do it in the, under the, in the new year. Councillor Murphy. Can I just ask, the 40-kilometre um, speed trial, is that proposed for South Ward or is that North Ward as well? It's just for the South Ward and it's not the whole South Ward. It's predominantly the section um, from Vincent Street under... Um, that goes all the way to the river. So it's not the whole of the South Ward. I don't know if we, will we say it's a quarter of the city of Vincent, roughly? I think, without measuring it, I think that's a fair estimate, uh, Michael. Yeah, I um, kind of tend to agree with Councillor Harley's uh, view on uh, speed humps. I find it difficult to bring myself to bring in another speed hump in the city of Vincent and I'm very supportive of a 40 kilometre um, trial and I feel that that is a much more uh, sophisticated way of dealing with um, traffic coming. Um, but I do um, yeah, I understand uh, Councillor Castle's uh, view where we have gone out to consultation and we are trying to um, uh, make some efforts um, but uh, I think uh, uh, accepting administration's report at this point is about as far as I am willing to go. Councillors, any further comments on the substantive? Yes. Councillor Hallott. Just a, a question. Um, have we ever, and um, what are the cost implications of removing speed humps um, in the future? Through you, Michael. That is a difficult question. I couldn't give you a... Um, you know, a clear answer, I suppose, an accurate answer. We do remove speed humps sometimes. They're mainly for resurfacing, and we tend to put them back. Uh, the cost is small because they can usually be removed, and it's just patching, so it's not a huge cost. So um, I suppose if the question is could these speed humps be removed, I'm thinking ahead, you know, if, if things um, uh, didn't work out as we hoped, then they could be removed for, a, for a, quite a low cost is the answer. Councillors? Through you, Chair. Just one more question um, in regards to the um, attachment to Edinburgh Street. And these are two speed humps which go across um, the width of the road. So, the same question through to the Director, through you, Chair, about the views of the residents of where those speed humps are going to be right at the front of. Do you have a record of those? Um, through you, McCall, I do, and I think they were issued as a additional um, information, a sort of a heat map with dots on. Um, around that area, there are green dots indicating <coughs> that the residents were supportive of, of the speed humps in that location. Any further comments or questions? Okay, I'll put the substantive. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost. Does anyone wish to move an alternative recommendation? Councillor Castle, moved. Seconded, Councillor Loden. Oh. Should make it. That's clear. up to you. Uh, That's um, up to the mover and seconder. On the yellow. Uh, yes. Yes, you yellow. do. Yeah, um, Councillor Castle, yellow. are you moving the yellow or the orange? Oh, sorry. The or no. Speed orange. humps or plateau? 
Speed hunts. Speed hunts is yellow. We're moving yeah. the yellow, seconded by Councillor Loden. Uh, I think we've really covered uh, most of the issues here. I, um, I think that um, although the data and the speeds don't technically satisfy um, the requirements for treatments, I think that the anecdotal evidence and the consultation has clearly shown a desire for some treatment. Um, and that I think that in the circumstances this is the, the, better, the better option of um, the treatments that we've considered. Thank you, Councillor Castle. Councillor Loden, does anyone wish to speak to the alternate recommendation? Okay, um, look, just to add that I can understand that there will still be some um, noise potentially associated with the speed humps, but I think that this finds the right balance between um, going with what was um, overwhelming support for traffic calming in this part of the street um, and lessening that noise by this only impacting uh, the traffic flowing along Edinburgh and no longer along Ellesmere. Um, I would have serious concerns with um, not putting a treatment here given the way that this process is sort of carried through on this occasion and the way in which I believe, having been part of the process, that um, there has been expectations that topography would be a major consideration in this um, particular matter and that's um, really the reason why I'm supporting it. I ideally would love to see 40 kilometres across all of Vincent but I think that is still some time away and um, in the meantime I think this is um, a viable solution to deal with the um, issues expressed by the residents over a period of um, years. Any further comments? I'll put it, all those in favour, all those against. Is that five, four and four against? So. Yes, five, five, four, so five, I believe there are five hands in the air for four. Can I just check? Yes, um, carried, thank you. Are you questioning my maths? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, one more item for engineering tonight. That's 10.3, no response of notice of motion, city building information. Move, Councillor Murphy, seconded. Councillor Gontoshevsky. Thank you. Look, I just wanted to pull this one out um, mainly to thank uh, administration. It's a pretty amazing effort. Um, and uh, just uh, acknowledge them, um, although we're getting it now, that we have had the uh, some bits and pieces that has actually um, fed into this year's budget process, which is great, so thank you um, very much. Uh, essentially, I mean, I think everyone in this room, including Vern over there in the gallery, who have talked about this um, ourselves is uh, concerned around the amount of buildings or and costs associated um, so we don't need to bang on about that um, essentially I'm heartened to see some solutions presented by administration um, around sharing assets um, sharing assets between community groups sharing assets with other councils um, I think that's really great out of the box thinking for local governments who would have thought to collaborate with other councils. Um, it's really uh, heartening and congratulations to you guys. Um, uh, um, I'm also stoked, <laughs> stoked, I'm also pleased with the... Uh, <laughs> Stoked. I'm stoked that um, that it's gone into uh, the corporate business plan for further investigation. <clears throat> Um, and look forward to future solutions presented to a pretty, ser um, you know, a pretty serious financial issue that we've got. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. I'm stoked that, that you uh, brought this item forward. Um, Councillor Gonczewski, do you wish to add? Does anyone wish to add or comment, question? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Um, on to item 11.1, .1, leases to Department of Health to govern departments' current use of child health clinics within the City of Vincent. Moved, Councillor Toppelberg. Seconded, Councillor Loden. Thank you. A uh, couple of comments. I note the Department's reluctance to provide 
uh, usage information, which uh, under the guise of it potentially compromising some of, uh, well, whether it be privacy or uh, uh, health matters or otherwise. But I think that you know, we've, got, we've got broad numbers in here that effectively is a few, if you average it out, is a few visits per day per centre, but we don't know if one of them is completely underutilised and one or two of them are uh, at breaking point and need, uh, need perhaps alternative um, premises or servicing. So I think that's a little bit disappointing given how small we are. But I just I wanted to note that um, the change to uh, item 2.2, which she talks about a lease extension, it's not given an option. Uh, and just to note, uh, whilst long outlast my time here, I can't see that the property on Harold Street, given its zoning and nature, will be the best use for that property for 20 years uh, from now. So uh, I think that we, uh, I think this is great that we're having this conversation, formalising it and acknowledging the great service that it provides for community and the role that local government plays in assisting, uh, assisting the health department to provide that service. Um, but back to Jimmy's uh, earlier point. Uh, in relation to our building assets and their purpose, uh, I think that 460 odd square metres of residential land un owned unencumbered directly opposite a park perhaps has better uses 20 years down the track. Thank you, Councillor Topper. Councillor Lowden. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I guess my comment similar to Councillor Topper, there is a cost associated with uh, the city's uh, continued role in this, but that is it does provide a really important service to our community. Um, my family has made use of those services and as have many um, over the years, so I think it's important that we play a role in that, uh, but it is an ongoing cost to the city as well. Um, and uh, a key component of that is uh, the electricity side of things. Um, I see there's an opportunity to help reduce those costs through installation of solar panels. So I would like to put forward an amendment on the pink. Um, do I have a seconder for the like amendment? like to get a seconder? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you. Um, so uh, I have had some conversations with the Director of Corporate Services on this and there is some updated information around um, the cost of electricity and who pays the bills and so forth. And so I just wanted to ask a question through the Director if she could provide some that updated information for everybody. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, we have been able to get some more detailed information on electricity charges for those three sites. It is a little difficult in that um, some of the metres cover obviously more than the one location on those sites. Um, one being Mount Hawthorne ha does have its own metre, so we were able to get specific information on that. Um, it appears that over the last 12 months for those three sites that we're talking about um, setting leases in place, the electricity charges is around four and a half thousand dollars. So of that seven thousand um, dollars, roughly around fifteen hundred each it varies a little. Um, so in discussing whether solar panels are an appropriate solution, we've looked at it in the broader context of um, a proposal to um, conduct a much more strategic review of solar panels across all of the city's buildings uh, in nineteen nineteen sorry, 2019, 2020, and there's money in the budget for that at the moment. So at this stage, the administration wouldn't recommend uh, going ahead with the amendment. And just to clarify in terms of who's responsible for the electricity for the Loftus Centre? Thank you. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, as a consequence of that discussion, um, we did uncover that the Loftus Community Centre has been paying the electricity for um, the Child Health Centre until this point. Um, now that we've um, uncovered that information, we are talking to Loftus Community Centre about how that's managed going forward. It's likely that they'll on forward the cost to the city and we'll meet those as part of the um, through the lease um, revenue that we're receiving. Thank you. Um, so I agree with the the principle of uh, doing these investigations. I guess I just don't see a reason why we need to delay um, an additional year. This seems like a fairly simple one to me. Uh, you're looking at four and a half thousand dollars worth of uh, electricity bills every year. That equates to roughly um, fifteen to twenty. 
uh, kilowatts of solar panels on those two facilities. They, as we've seen from previous investigations, they pay for themselves in three to five years. So waiting an additional year whilst we develop the sustainable environment strategy to then tell us that we need to do something we already need know we need to do doesn't seem to be a point in waiting. Uh, and so as such, I would appreciate people's support. Councillors? Um, I just want to ask a question. Sorry, Councillor Gondoshevsi. Oh, look, I was just going to ask a question. In terms of the child health sites, I understand the intent of the, um, the amendment, but this, given that the sites are located, for example, Mount Hawthorne Child Health Nurse is located within, um, just underneath the main hall at Braithwaite, um, I'm just wondering about actually just putting solar panels on for the child health facility in the absence of dealing with the, the main hall and potentially the lesser hall, for example, given and the toy library, given that it's part of the one building, if you could pretend, um, deal with that, if you could actually, you know, would like, for example, would the long-term goal be to provide solar panels for the entire site to service all of the main hall and lesser hall, rather than doing something that would just service what is effectively a room within that whole complex. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Mount Hawthorne um, is the one that has its own, at the moment, has its own metre, so that would be the one that is more simple to do uh, as a standalone solar solution. Uh, the other two premises it would be a lot more difficult. We would have to look at standalone metres. Um, my understanding is that that's the only way that we can have them connected up uh, to solar. Um, so there would be an expense associated with that that we wouldn't have, obviously, if we were look to do, looking to do the whole building. So um, hence the preference to sort of look at it more strategically. Mount Hawthorne, however, we could look at doing uh, on its own at the moment. Um, the challenge that we have is whether the power is mostly being used during the day, which is an issue that's come up when we've uh, looked at the other solar facilities that we're installing this year. Um, we're not sure whether most of that solar, whether most of that energy is being used during the day or some of it's used at night, for example, security lights, refrigeration, um, sterilisation equipment, etc. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Look, I'm really supportive of doing investigations. I think but I do think this is being dealt with within the draft corporate business plan. I would probably prefer to do this in a stepwise structured manner and I get concerned when I can appreciate the sentiment but I do think if we, you know, I think that, it's to, that we need to consider these things in the context of the broader project as part of the broader corporate business plan. So despite being the seconder, I'm not supportive of the amendment. Councillors, any further comments on the amendment? Um, Councillor Murphy? Oh, I just wanted to say I do support investigation, but I do also support the amendment <laughs> in the sense that, um, you know, I think it will just come back in the plan that we need to do solar panels. And if we need to get a battery, we can get a battery. So that's my view. I'm happy to support it. Councillor Toppelberg? Um, so the amendment, as it's written, says uh, if it's economic, uh, so we're on the pink, so uh, if it's economic. Um, oh, that's all right, I've answered my question, that's okay, I'm comfortable. Councillors? Um, look, I, I will speak to the amendment. I feel there's been a pretty strong objection from administration in the comment, um, and I, I am concerned about looking at um, clinics within broader um, City of Vincent owned um, facilities. I, my, my preference would be that if we're going to look at a facility, it would be in its entirety. We'd be looking at the roof space to generate the power for the whole, the, the, the two halls. We're doing the upgrade of the um, lesser hall uh, next financial year. Um, I do think this is slightly ad hoc and I would find it strange to consider going in and putting solar panels just for the use of um, the child health nurse without um, considering the broader um, you know, the broader use of that facility and, and actually just putting um, solar panels across the, the roof space to service the whole um, facility. So um, I do appreciate the intent. I note administration's um, 
preference um, and I just would prefer to see an approach that it, it would be at least strategic in line with what administration's saying but um, also would, would take into consideration whole facilities and not just one operation out of an existing facility. So I, I don't support the amendment. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost. Back to the substantive. Are there any further comments on the substantive about the... Yes, Councillor Harley? Can I just... I'm on 11.1, .1, right? Yep, okay, just, That's check, correct. just checking back in, checking back in. It is the Child Sorry. Health Clinic. The little soothers are helping, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I just want a, a couple of questions in regards to, um, in total, what the net uh, benefit is, subsidy, we're giving to the Department of Health in regards to the proposal before us. Through you, Mayor Cole, the total subsidy across the three centres would be approximately $23,000. That does include depreciation for those parts of those buildings. Um, so that's the total subsidy that we would be looking at. Thank you, Director. And just for the record, um, if we were to compare these leases with uh, Leadville Tennis Club, um, I'm back on the tennis again, um, uh, uh, um, any of the toy libraries, any of the um, play groups, what are some of the things that we are paying um, f on behalf of the health department, not wearing that right, sorry, um, in comparison with other leaseholders? So what are the health department not paying in comparison to other leaseholders, apart from rent? Through you, Mayor Cole, it would very much vary on a lease by lease basis okay. and we are working through some of the leases where uh, there previously hasn't been a much of a commercial um, um, approach to them at all. Uh, but I would have to come back to you on on case by case basis. Um, it, it very much varies depending on what the um, organisation does and, and the value it adds to the community, etc. Yeah. I guess my point is that our move is for um, to ensure that our leaseholders are paying um, a fair tenancy rate. I know that's not doesn't occur in all of them, um, and that they take responsibility for some of the costs, including um, in, in sometimes infrastructure and um, some of the maintenance. Obviously, every lease we have is a little bit different. Um, I don't support this. I absolutely support the work of the child health centres. Um, my own son was taken to a child health centre in Wanneroo. They had one. For the entire, for the entire city, Wanneroo. Um, it was a long time ago, back in 1986. So, I'm sure they've got a lot more clinics now. Um, I am um, disappointed that we don't have usage figures because I would be certainly. My understanding of the child health centres is they take from the local intake. So, in a four square kilometre city, um, we are serviced by um, by a lot of clinics, right, for such a small area. Um, I, the health department budget is 14. Point one billion dollars, and I have to ask whether they need the money more than we do, and they don't. There is no possible way that this could be cut um, to justify the health department with a fourteen point one billion dollar budget getting a subsidy from the city of Vincent, who has oh, what fifty six million dollars per annum in total. I just think it's. I think they should pay their own way and um, I think government departments, unless there are extraordinary circumstances, should pay their own way. They can afford it. Um, if this was a little non-government organisation um, providing a service to the city, um, I would look on it completely differently. Of course I would. Um, I would look on it differently if it was a playgroup, actually, because in terms of benefits to um, to the city and its residents, I think you could just as easily argue that there are benefits in the child health centres as there are in playgroups, as there are in having you know, a good um, choice of medical practitioners. And Mount Hawthorne in particular is completely over-serviced by medical practitioners, I have to say for the record. We are spoilt for choice in regards to everything you can possibly imagine, medical, dental, physio, chiropractic, the whole lot. I haven't looked closely at um, Highgate and the other areas, but I would say as a local and inner urban area, we are well serviced by medical practitioners generally. So I cannot in good conscience support a $14.1 billion organisation 
receiving a subsidy in the amount that's being um, proposed by the officers. So I definitely won't be supporting it. Councillors? Um, I just had a couple of questions, um, Director of Corporate Services. I just wanted to follow up on my comment or question rather at the briefing last Tuesday um, where I talked about the fact that would there be possible to have some recognition that the service is, is provided in partnership between the Department of Health and the City of Vincent given some of the issues that Councillor Harley has just raised? Was there any opportunity to discuss? Oh, sorry, I see. Sorry, the CEO is pointing out to me that it has in fact been acknowledged in Clause 2.14, which now states that the Department of Health is to acknowledge the support of the city through on-site signage and references in documents where appropriate. Um, the other question I had, thank you, CEO. Thank you for answering my question. The other question I had was just in relation to the reduction of cleaning to three times per week. Just given that this is a child health clinic and that you can sometimes get... Um, Children, well, babies that have um, low immunity and, and small children that are prone to share illnesses and be susceptible to illnesses. If it was found that the three um, cleans per week were not sufficient, um, would the city be able to require the Department of Health to p pay for any additional cleaning services? Uh, thank you, Mayor Call. Um, I would have to look into that. I, I know that we had agreed with the Health Department that that would be an, an appropriate cleaning schedule. Um, we can certainly look into that with the health department. Um, I don't think they would have any concerns with upping the cleaning if that was required. And that they would pay for that? That would be the intention, okay. yeah, but Thank I can you. clarify that with them. Thank you. Okay, look, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, I do take Councillor Harley's point, but I'd also like to acknowledge that this is the first time we've actually been able to get any funding from the Department of Health. This is actually funding that has never been paid. I know it's only $5,000, but this is a step forward to where the city has been providing this, these facilities and, and bearing this cost over a large period of time. So I'd like to say thank you to, to the director for actually getting us to this point where we're actually having proper leasing arrangements and that we are getting some payment from the Department of Health. I think this is a good starting point. I also would like to say that it is really great to see that a clause added that there will be acknowledgement of um, the support of the city because I do think that it is important to say to, to customers of child health clinics that um, this is not only through the Department of Health but through the support of the City of Vincent. Um, I do think that child health nurses play a different role to a standard GP in that they um, are able to provide a level of expertise and service which is very dedicated towards newborns and um, early child health, um, that they are able to do uh, home visits. They also start um, play groups. They bring um, parents together and will have an informative sessions of, of, I think from memory, around five weeks of play group where they're actually facilitating not only education for, for new parents but also fostering and helping to start up play groups. So they, they, they do um, have that very much um, health, um, community health home visits and um, a very um, specific role that they play. And um, I think that they do develop really strong relationships with new parents in their local communities. So I think it is a really important and valuable service which is quite different to anything else offered in the community. And I think it is a really good step forward that the Department of Health is starting to formalise the arrangement and pay some of their way. And perhaps this is a starting point for us to work on over time. So I support the um, recommendation. Are there any further comments or questions? Councillor Fatakis. Um, uh, just with uh, regards to, it's true you may uh, uh, call to the directors, with uh, usage levels, and I noticed um, where we've got on um, uh, point 2.4 um, based on current uh, usage levels. Um, what, um, in the event that we suddenly see a substantial increase in the usage of those sites. Do we have an ability to renegotiate um, that lease amount? Through you, Mayor Cole, because it would be written into the lease, we would have the capacity to renegotiate that uh, lease amount. 
And um, just on the cleaning, I, I'm like Nicole. I'm surprised at only um, three uh, three times. I think it was Councillor Harley. Sorry, on three times per week. I mean, I'd like to actually know what the health department's own regulations are with regards to um, ch private childcare centres, um, because I would anticipate that that would need to be done on a daily level. So I'd like to actually have some assurance that that's consistent with their own expectations of other similar um, privately run facilities as well. Um, Councillor Fatakis, was that a question or a comment? Um, so can I, uh, I'll ask a question of that, can I, um, um, ask the director to actually um, look into that and actually in ensure that um, those that cleaning frequency actually is in line with um, with other standards. If in fact it uh, does need to be done on a daily basis rather than three times a week. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Cole, um, it may be, and I wasn't close enough to the negotiations, but it may be that um, those centres aren't open every day, um, but I can certainly um, get some more information on that. I know that the Health Department was happy with that cleaning schedule, um, and I'm assuming that would be based on their standards, but I can get some more information on that. Now that you say that, Director, that I think would be the case that they're not operating five days a week, but it would be good to get that information and be sure. Are there any further comments or questions? I've got sorry. Councillor Hallett. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Hallett had his hand in the air. Just a, a question as well. Um, just, sorry, I can't remember who asked about the negotiating a different amount at a future lease time would be potentially possible. Um, given that they're not always open or well, they're not open five days a week, is there potential to um, negotiate other uses of those sites on days when they're not open um, in a future time? Through you, Mayor Cole, at the moment the lease is specific for uh, to child health services um, with Department of Health, but they could certainly approach us or we could um, explore those options with them for um, using it for other services as well. Um, the other thing is in relation to the um, lease fee at the moment, it's for the five-year period, but the uh, lease extension, um, as Councillor Topperberg point, rightly pointed out, is completely a, our option, and um, that would obviously allow us to negotiate further on, um, on the lease fee. Councillor Harley? I have a question just um, triggered by Count Councillor Fatakis' um, question um, about whether the director has um, to hand or whether you could send it out to councillors, the actual opening times of the clinics, because from what you've just said, they're not all open five <coughs> days a week, which makes the whole thing a bit more curious. Sorry. But it would be interesting um, if you could please distribute those or advise council now if you've got those opening times to hand. Through you, Mayor Cole, I don't have those opening times to hand at the moment, but uh, we can certainly get those distributed fairly quickly. Councillors, any further comments or questions? Councillor Tobelberg? That will close the debate, but I'll happily do so at this point. Um, just, I uh, just want to make a general, and I did ask the question last week at the briefing, it is generally, it is historically been, since this service has been in operation, historically it has been an unwritten partnership effectively between local government and the Department of Health. This isn't them imposing an external service to non-Vincent residents that we're giving them free space for. This is a critical service and my understanding, you can't refuse it, it actually is provided to every single child that is born within our boundaries. So for me it's actually a community service that the department is providing and we're providing the space for. I don't see this as cost shifting or, uh, I mean, I've been fairly uh, militant on those sorts of things over time. I actually see this as a great service that is provided historically between local government and the Department of Health. And we are moving towards formalising that arrangement, but the idea that it's somehow their service that it's almost exclusively for our residents in the locations that it is. And I would hate to think that by turning around saying, no, pay for all your outgoings, pay for all your electricity, pay for the building maintenance costs uh, and give us $20,000 a year in rent because that's the commercial rate. We all of a sudden have one child health uh, centre within Vincent and people have to wait days to potentially get in. I think that would be uh, a, a terrible outcome. So yeah, I'd look, I, I think, um, I don't even, I, I'd like to get some more information uh, in the long term, uh, sometime in the next four and a half years before we revisit this again. Um, 
about how many of the centres that operate are owned by local governments and how many the department either leases uh, commercially or owns or otherwise, because I think that would be interesting in the broader context, but certainly in terms of the service that's provided in Vincent, I'd, yeah, for me, I'd, I'd, I don't think this is something that the Department of Health is getting a free ride from the City of Vincent. I think we are pr providing, helping to provide a critical service for uh, our local community, and it's being offered by the Department of Health. So I've got, um, I'm comfortable with the officer recommendation. That closing debate, I'll put it. All those in favour of the motion? All those against? I declare it carried. That takes us to community engagement at item 12.1, seasonal licences for use of Charles Veryard Pavilion, Modernians Hockey Club and Chuart Hill Cricket Club and Mount Hawthorne Cardinals Junior Football Club. Can I have a mover for this item, please? Moved Councillor Castle, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. Uh, yes, I I am supportive of the council of the administration recommendation, um, with the exception of the fee that is being imposed on the Mount Hawthorne Cardinals. Um, I'm happy to let debate continue, but I flag that I'll be moving the amendment on the purple. Councillor Gonchewski. Supportive of the recommendation. Happy to second the amendment. Um, should I come forward? Um, and just also to note, I just uh, I'm very appreciative. I think that this is an area, much with the last item, where we are moving to a much higher level of maturity, and I think that bodes well from a transparency point of view um, and how we can engage with our community going forward um, on um, some of our um, uh, licences for and, and leases. So. Um, uh, that's all I've got to say on that one. I just want to clarify, are you seeking to move the amendment at this point and are you wishing to second at this point or are you wishing to come back to that? You're wishing, it sounds like you're wishing to come back to it. Uh, not necessarily. I'm happy to move it now. I just had a thought that I wasn't sure if I was allowed to come back to it, actually. Um, well, you can move already. it at any point, so um, um, that's... That's fine. I'll move it now. The no <laughs> obligation to move it now, just vessel. to be clear. <laughs> so uh, you're, move, you're wishing yeah. to move the amendment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councillor Gondoshevsky indicated you're willing to second the amendment. Okay, so we're dealing with the amendment, which is on the purple. Uh, so I, I'm supportive of this amendment because I think it reflects the, the transitional um, arrangements that we've had with a number of other supporting sporting clubs in the area um, and it, um, it, it's consistent with the approach that we've had towards moving these groups into a more formalised lease and licence um, arrangement. I think given that the Cardinals have a high proportion of junior members and that in the past they've paid nothing and this would be quite a significant cost all at once that, um, that the uh, waiver of their fees their licence fees for the two years um, just gives them some time to adjust to the new arrangement and uh, and put some some plans in place to cover that in the future. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, just recognising that, you know, uh, the club has... Um, it's, has uh, traditionally been located at Menzies. Um, we see a transition here um, as in terms of both the um, uh, and, and in terms of the, the fees paid. I think I'm looking forward to having a framework for these decisions to be considered against in future. Um, but I recognise there has been some conversation with the community and we've received, um, you know, um, correspondence in relation to this, these fees. I don't think that they're particularly high, but I recognise um, in terms of if you look at per per member. But um, I do think that we need to be conscious of um, uh, managing the transition. So I'll support the amendment in this instance. Councillor Toppleberg. Thank you. Just a question to the Director of Community Engagement. Are you aware of the current? Uh, fees for juniors that they charge, uh, what their registration fees are or what the, what the club actually charge 
their players? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, not off the top of my head, although we have had that conversation with uh, many of the clubs, including the Junior Football Club. Um, a general statement would be comparably uh, the fees seem to be lower compared to other clubs. Um, having said that, uh, that is really anecdotal um, based on our knowledge of just a few clubs. So um, I can certainly get that information for you, and the football club has been forthcoming with that. I just don't have it to hand. Um, just further to that question, um, my understanding is that it's $140 per player per season and that when the director and I met with the Cardinals, we did raise with them that that fee did seem low and they indicated that they were increasing fees annually and that they had acknowledged that they did need to um, increase their fee structure over time. Uh, that's well, that's That was going to be my comment. Thank you, Mayor Cole. I have no issue with the amendment in principle, but it is something that's transitional. I mean, ultimately, this conversation more broadly, as Councillor Gontoshevsky has indicated, is about uh, maturity as a community and as a public, uh, or the, the owner of a public facility, uh, such as we are. But these things cost money, and ultimately, that cost is borne somewhere. Uh, we've been shouldering it for a, a long period of time, and certainly clubs that uh, don't have the membership base to sustain themselves have issues and have to look at uh, whether it be amalgamation or moving or otherwise, and clubs that do have the membership base to sustain it need to look at charging appropriate fees that enable a fair distribution. I think, um, yes, I'm, I'm supportive of the amendment as a transitional arrangement. Councillors, Councillor Lowden. Sorry, this might be an, an obvious question. Uh, so this is, what, is a waiver for how, lo how long, for the duration of the licence fee, which I, I, I couldn't find it on the amendment. Is it? Through Mayor Cole, it's two, two seasons, so two years. And then at the end of that, there'll be a renegotiation around how that all works, by which time we hope to have our new fee structure in place. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Uh, at that time, we will have the lease and licence framework in place. Um, and also, it's a transitional arrangement, not, not just for the junior football club, but for the two other clubs um, having another club on site with increased utilisation of both the building and the reserves. So all three clubs have agreed that it, it would be opportune to review the entire arrangement um, in a shorter time frame than normal. Councillors on the uh, amendment? Um, look, I will speak to it. Um, given that I've been involved in the discussions with the Director of Community Engagement, it has actually taken four years to um, reach this point, and that might be surprising given that um, Charles Villiard Pavilion was upgraded um, with the intent of sharing that facility between the Mods and the Cardinals for the winter season. Um, given that the Cardinals had not been paying any fees for use of facilities for the history of the club. Um, there's a real nervousness from that club around um, signing up to a, um, an agreement. Um, they were very nervous about additional costs that would be borne by the club. Um, it did take a lot of work to, to sort of bring them to this agreement and uh, there was sort of some frustration along the way through from the mods and other teams but there was always a good spirit between the clubs to sort this out and with the city um, continuing the discussions. Um, I do believe that the waiver is an important part of of this um, proposal to get the Cardinals to support having a joint licence agreement with um, the MODs. Um, given that they haven't had to pay fees, um, this is a big step forward. They are actually paying for the outgoings under this agreement, which is the, the um, substantial cost um, to the city. The licence fee is actually a lesser cost when you compare to the outgoings that we have estimated for the club to have to pay. And it really is about um, providing that club with that um, sense of ownership over the pavilion to make them feel that they are um, partly... Um, you know that, that that is potentially a long-term solution for them. There's been discussion in the club about where their home is and that Menzies is their home. Um, we did fear at one point that if we didn't get this agreement on the table that there would be a push from the club for us to 
um, then upgrade the facilities at Menzies to have a scoreboard put in at Menzies, which they have funding from the federal men, um, state member for Perth, um, John Kerry, MLA. So there is also a growing tension at Menzies um, amongst the, um, the users, the recreational users, the dog walkers, and um, the football that's being played there. So I do believe it was really important to um, convince the Cardinals to really have this joint licence agreement at Charles Vuillard in order for them to feel more of a transition over to that location. And while they will continue to use both grounds, it does firmly um, place them in a, in a position to um, have a have a sort of more um, long-lasting and ongoing relationship and, and um, and home at uh, Charles Vuillard. So I think that this is a really um, good way of actually saying to the club, we understand where you come from, we understand where you're going. We've had some tough conversations around fees um, that they charge and that um, this is something that we would like for them to look at. So it has been um, a long and ongoing discussion over a four-year period. It's not an insignificant thing to have this before you tonight to be um, voting on. So um, are there any further comments or questions? OK, I'll put it all those in favour. Declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments on the substantive motion? I'll put it all those in favour. I declare the motion carried. Uh, that takes us to item 12.3, 2018-19 festivals and events sponsorship, which is an absolute majority decision. Um, and we do have two um, members that are vacating the chamber, so we'll just give them a moment. Um, can I please have a mover and a seconder for 12.3? Move, Councillor Harley, seconded, Councillor Fatakis. Um, I'm generally supportive of the proposal, but I've got a number of questions and I note that there's an amendment um, here. There's actually two amendments here as well, which I'm sure um, people want us to have a look at as well. Um, I've got a number of, um, a number of questions about um, things that have been supported and then things that haven't been supported. So I just want to get a better understanding um, from from admin about why things weren't supported. Um, and I'll start with the Leadville Connect. Um, I, would, I would like to know why we're funding them $50,000. And as part of that, I'd like to know what the numbers were um, and what the benefit was for the city. Um, all others bar North Perth local have received um, significantly, and Mount Hawthorne Hub, significantly less than what that asked for. So I just want a better understanding of the Leaderville Connect amount, which is significant in my view. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. So all of the sponsorship missions, uh, submissions were assessed on their merits. Um, an example there is North Perth Local, who, who certainly are receiving significantly less than they did last year, having said that they applied for significantly less um, than they did last year. Um, most of the, the other um, submissions, particularly those larger festivals and events that are generally coordinated through the town teams, um, were very robust um, submissions that could clearly demonstrate um, broad community development um, outcomes and um, I guess broadly speaking um, high engagement with both the business and, and resident communities. So um, I guess broadly speaking in answer to Councillor Harley's question, each submission was um, assessed on its merits and um, officers then allocated or recommended allocating of sponsorship funding accordingly. So a question specifically in regards to the Leaderville Connect. I understand there's a um, the festival itself isn't going to be run, but I want to have a better understanding of what the benefit was to the city in terms of attendance numbers, etc. Through you, Mayor Cole, I don't have the submission to hand. Having said that, uh, Leaderville Connect and certainly through Leedy uh, Palooza demonstrated last year quite significant attendance um, at their event, particularly with the collaboration and partnership as part of Fringe World. 
Uh, so their submission did successfully demonstrate um, high attendances. Um, other sources of funding that um, contributed significantly to the overall project budget um, and a variety of events um, over an extended period of time. So there was a number of um, elements to the Leadable Connect submission that um, made it um, fairly easy for administration to justify um, sponsorship to the um, level that they had requested. Thank you. Through you, Chair, to the Director. And my other question was, are you able to talk us through the Western Arts Precinct and about why that wasn't funded? And I've read the, I've read the notes. I just want some more information about why that wasn't funded and how that differs from other street community type parties which are being funded. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that uh, submission was looked at quite closely for a couple of different reasons. First and foremost, administration being aware that West End Arts Precinct are um, an emerging or, or hoping to be one of um, our town teams. So we did look at it quite closely in that regard. The, the block party um, submission was um, fairly brief. Uh, and administration identified that there may indeed be some benefits behind supporting that particular group and funding that particular group so they can get some increased activation and engagement with the community. And therefore, as we have done with other street parties, we've generally funded those through our community grants program. Um, and so that's what officers have recommended in this regard, is that we, we take that out of the festivals and events sponsorship, sponsorship submissions, spend some more time working with the West End Arts Precinct in terms of how are they going um, in terms of their formation of, of, as a town team, and therefore what are their priorities. And if one of those is indeed a street party or a block party, we can then look to support that through the community grants program as an alternative. Um, so my question in regards to the North Perth Halloween, um, which is effectively a, a, a Halloween street um, party through street closure, I'm just trying to understand the difference because to me they're, they're kind of the same thing in terms of a street party, albeit that one's under a local group. So are you saying that for the Western Arts Precinct, if they were to be part of a town town team organisation then an, an event such as this is more likely to get funded in the same way that the North Perth Halloween does or are you saying that because they're an arts group they would need to go through a different form of grants funding? I'm just trying to understand the difference. Through you Mayor Cole, no it isn't in relation to the, the arts component of, of the group. Um, it is very much around um, this current status of the Western Arts Precinct group um, and on that basis, it would be difficult for the city to provide sponsorship through this particular forum. Um, administration does need to do some more work with that particular group to work out, um, had they been incorporated yet? Um, how engaged are they with all of the local businesses in that area? What are their priorities? Do they have a strategic plan yet? So they're all the sorts of conversations we can have with them prior to allocating a community grant because they are rolling grants, whereas this is the one time of the year that we bring festivals and events sponsorship to council. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. So my other um, question then is in regards to we provide, uh, provide a lot of in-kind support and I know it's embedded um, through the report, but I do feel it's important that people can very easily see um, not just how much cash we're giving out in that form of funding, but how much we actually pay out in, in, in kind. This is still a cost to the city in both, you know, in sometimes physical resources, but also um, in human resources, etc. And I think it's important that, um, particularly where we are either not agreeing to the amount requested or whether we're reducing from a previous year, that we make it clear to the public even through the addition of, a, of another column. I think this was raised a few years ago, actually, um, about transparency and funding. And in some cases, we'd significantly re reduced funding, but we'd added on something like $20,000 of in-kind. And I think the ratepayers um, should know that we are still supporting many of these groups through other ways and that the other things that we do cost the city money. So I certainly would like to see... Um, whether it's on our website or something else, through a communique and how we're supporting local um, community festivals, etc. 
about what the city actually does in um, in full for these groups? Through you, Mayor Cole, we, we can certainly um, include that in any, in any communications. We do indeed include both the cash and the in-kind support in the grant agreement or the sponsorship agreement that we enter into. Um, it was two years ago, and in fact, um, my first year here at the city that we did indeed include that in-kind column as part of recommendation number one. The reason why we took that out last year and this year is because of the the current status of these events is that they're just sponsorship submissions at the moment. So a lot of the in-kind support is related to approvals, which still remains subject to um, the application process for, for the various approvals that they require. So we took it out of the recommendation because it is only a cost estimate, but we still embed that information in the body of the report so it is transparent and recognised. Councillor Hulley, do you wish to speak further or ask any questions? Okay. Um, Councillor Toppleberg, Councillor Pataka, sorry. Sorry, yeah. As a se uh, seconder, I'd like to speak to the substantive, but should I move um, an amendment while I speak to or allow Councillor Toppleberg to speak after me? It's completely at your discretion. You can move an amendment at any time. Okay. I'll, um, I'll firstly speak to the substantive of why um, I support. Um, the funding amounts as they've been, uh, been indicated um, with the town teams and this comes a lot from my personal experience. Um, a lot of the key issues I think in considering which projects um, get uh, approved and, and, which, and which don't, a lot come down to, in my opinion, capability to deliver and the viability of the group um, who's actually doing the proposal. And I think capability to deliver speaks a lot to the success of uh, groups like Leaderville Connect, Mount Hawthorne Hub and North Perth Local. I think preparedness to collaborate um, within the community between business groups and, and co um, community groups as well as the collaboration with the city. Um, and again, history and our more established town teams um, speak to that as um, uh, as well so I'm fully in support of the um, the amounts um, that the officers have um, have recommended as well as looking at the submission that Leaderville Connective submitted it's four weeks of events um, last year two of those events um, through Fringe World received uh, nominations Fringe World and nominations and I think that speaks to a lot to the success of the week in the first uh, year of those events that they received those nominations and one in fact won the Fringe World um, award and that was Dancing in the Street so I think that um, without repeating myself too much um, says a lot about the capability of the group in being able um, to deliver so um, I have um, I have faith that that fifty thousand um, is um, is an accurately um, placed amount um, for that group. Um, I'll allow C Councillor Toppleberg to to speak to. Councillor Toppleberg, come on down. Permission. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, you put your That's all right. Um, so I still think we and it's I first want to acknowledge the director and the team's role in. Uh, getting us to the point where we are because I think that we have a lot more information and a lot better information each year than we do in the previous years and it makes the process much easier, it's much clearer uh, for everybody and I think the, the missing piece which is still uh, the, the difficult thing is that assessment of benefit to community and value for money and what that actually means because it may mean different things to different people. Um, I guess uh, the, well actually I'm going to ask a question. The the summary of the Australianality uh, proposal says that it will include an art exhibition, artist talks, film programs and community events run in conjunction with the local businesses including Soggy Bones, Linton and Kay, Friday Studio in the back lot. And then if you look at the submission that's not recommended to be supported, which is for West End Arts Precinct, which is the block party, it's talking, I know it's, it's talking about showcasing their creative wares, galleries and studios, which is effectively opening their businesses. I'll acknowledge that. Workshops, performances, entertainment, movie screenings, art exhibitions. Are they two completely separate things or are they... I'm just trying to get a, a gauge of what's going on within that community. I'll talk more to it uh, in a moment. But are we, are we certain that they're two completely separate events or that perhaps the block party is part of the Australianality and that we've maybe 
inadvertently seen two bites of the cherry being requested within that? Through you, Mayor Cole, they, they certainly are presented as two separate submissions um, that uh, have varying references to each other. Uh, the West End Arts Precinct uh, submission does directly reference the Holmes of Court Gallery exhibition, so that does directly reference that particular event forming part of the broader um, block party. The Holmes of Court Gallery um, identifies potential for partnerships but presents itself as a standalone exhibition. Um, not part of a, a broader event. Um, so that, that, that certainly is one of the challenges with, with those two um, submissions and probably does to some degree reflect the current status of that emerging town team, that they're not, they're not currently a town team yet and therefore they don't have a consolidated submission in full integration and collaboration with surrounding businesses. So um, administration's view is it's probably reflective of, of just the current um, status of that emerging arts, arts precinct. Um, yeah, so look, I, I am vehemently supportive of the, the intent and what's going on in that uh, part of Vincent. One of the issues that we have is that if you talk about geographically, locally, it's mostly either industrial or it's not businesses that are conducive to event type activity. So you've got a large scale printer. There's obviously, I think automotive holdings have 50% of the land mass within there. You've got a lot of vehicle servicing. Like, like there's a lot of businesses. So I, I guess I'm acutely aware, whilst there is intent to run as, and I applaud the submissions and the intent in terms of it being festival and arts based and touching all of those things that uh, Vincent is the champion of, we also need to be careful about effectively funding a very small number of businesses to actually further their individual commercial interest because ultimately there isn't, it's very difficult to identify for me a broader benefit within that particular locality. If the, that group, so I, I guess I have, I, I need a, a better understanding of what, how that benefit would be uh, felt more broadly. I note that there's two proposed amendments uh, there, one of which is from Mayor Cole, which is effectively to uh, def uh, defer consideration of that. Uh, of um, those two submissions uh, and to come back later date. The other is, uh, actually I'll move mine, which is effectively to give them $10,000. So I'll move the amendment on the lavender, if I may. Is there a seconder for the lavender? Councillor Harley. Okay, so uh, this does a couple of things. Uh, firstly, uh, whilst it doesn't deal with in-kind, it does uh, bring the numbers uh, under $300,000, which I think is probably a fairly good benchmark for where, if you look at our overall finances and what $300,000 means uh, at the City of Vincent, I think that's probably a good, uh, a good ceiling. That's a, a separate discussion, but that's more ideological. Um, I guess, for me, we brought these submissions, to, and I understand the intent of uh, what the Mayor was, uh, has proposed and uh, about deferring consideration of it, but I guess we go through a process, we go out to the community and we say once a year you come, we have other funding for other events or other community based, uh, if you can demonstrate benefit we can find ways, but essentially this is a tell us what you're going to do, explain it to us, we will assess it and we will then make a decision on it. I guess uh, for me that process should be singular and we shouldn't be going and having side negotiations along the way thereafter. I, 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 don't necessarily feel that passionately about that, but I think that it kind of opens it up to people coming along and saying, well, you know, my submission wasn't quite understood, I wanted to do this or that, and why can't I get another, uh, you know, it, it was more in line with this, this ideal, uh, or this idea. So um, my biggest concern about the Home Support Gallery uh, submission was the uh, effectively, well, it's mostly paid events, but also the, administ uh, the administrative costs uh, that are associated with it. Um, won't disclose that because that's in it's not con uh, contained in this part of the report. But I think that it was quite high and not something. There's no demonstrated broad community benefit uh, from it. But I do think there's enough within that. And given the response I had earlier, which indicated that the block party was actually probably going to be a part of this event, I think that the way that the report deals with the West End, um, uh, <coughs> the way that the report deals with the proposal from the West End Arts Precinct is appropriate, saying that we will work with them uh, to look at accessing other funding. But this says, great idea, we think we can work with it and we think there can be community benefit, but at $10,000 it's effectively providing seed funding. It's not 
being the major the major sponsor of the event or anchoring it, and uh, that is turning that responsibility back to the uh, the proponent. So, um, not sure how it'll fly, but move the amendment. We'll see what happens. Councillor Harley, thank you. Yes, I support the amendment. This. This area, as most people know, is a burgeoning area. Um, there is no doubt that in 10 years, maybe even sooner, it will look very different to what it is now if everyone's um, plans kind of um, pay off. And they certainly are seeing more businesses being attracted to and showing interest in this area with the Homes of Court Gallery seemingly now being a kind of anchor tenant in that area. And so in and of itself, bringing new people to that little kind of side bit on the freeway that people have driven by for years. Um, so I, um, I would like to see the city obviously support it. Um, and I think that this is a fair amount for a first um, and unproven event. Um, and for us to work with the applicants on that event, and I wouldn't be opposed to seeing some in-kind support offered to them as well, or at least that we ask if they need in-kind support in terms of street closures or signage um, and promotion on our website and things like that. Um, I think it is a whole new area for the City of Vincent to start exploring, and I think that it should be applauded that a group of, while well, they want quite a lot of money, that they're actually, as a group of businesses, are getting off their backsides and they're putting their ideas into action. So they'll, I think they'll be disappointed with the amount. But I would say that, um, like other events that over the years we've needed to support for a while, um, some years we've increased their funding, other years we've decreased their funding so that they're less reliant. We've always relied on evidence. Well, in more recent years we've relied on evidence and I think that's a good um, a good methodology to adopt. So I'd be really keen to see how this particular exhibition goes. I'm glad they're going to have a free exhibition. Um, and um, I think that we should heavily promote it, particularly given that there's a very strong cultural aspect. And I understand one of the biggest um, um, collections of Aboriginal art in Australia, not the biggest, but one of the biggest. So um, I would be supportive of the amendment as it is. Councillors on the amendment. Councillor Fatakis. Um, I'm not supportive of the amendment. I still think there's some um, some work to be done uh, with the precinct group. I think there's a, um, arriving at a lot more support that Vincent um, can, the city of Vincent can provide, and particularly based on the huge amount of learnings that we've had from the development of um, some of Perth's most successful town teams. I think we need to have some clarification on who we're dealing with. Um, whether you know a precinct group or um, a private group of um, of businesses, um, and really getting uh, getting a lot more uh, collaboration and coordination, obviously happening in that group, um, it's emerging. Um, but I think there's still a lot more uh, assistance that uh, that we can provide and a lot more clarity that I'd like to see. Councillors, um, my preference would be that we go back to Janet Holmes Court Gallery and to um, the to the uh, West End Arts Precinct and actually talk to them because I think there was, as you've highlighted, Councillor Tovelberg, some commonalities between the two proposals and really to flesh out um, that this new emerging potential town team is is backing um, what's proposed in the Janet Holmes Court proposal um, and just to make sure that um, there is some that, that there is agreement and that this is generally heading in the direction that that precinct wants to head in. Um, I think that there's a lot of merit to the Janet Holmes Court proposal. Um, it's an exciting opportunity to have an exhibition which is not something that we have supported through this type of events and sponsorship and it is a point of difference. It's great for the, for the arts. Um, I had asked some questions around what level of local artists are involved and I think other than um, being told that they're West Australian artists. We weren't able to drill down in the time before this evening, given that the curator is overseas. Um, so for me, it's not about side deals. It's, it's not about stepping away from what has been proposed. It's about discussing what's been proposed in that um, context of the West End Arts Precinct, um, having the conversation with that emerging group about um, what their preference would be and whether they're on board with the 
with the Janet Holmes Accord proposal. Um, it's not about walking away from that or not supporting that, and it's just really asking for an additional month to have the conversation um, so that we can make sure that that's supporting what that emerging group wants to do in that area. So um, I, I don't support the amendment before us because I'd like for there to be a bit more discussion and um, discussion with what's being proposed in terms of local artists, discussion with West in Arts Precinct and just making sure that that's the right way to spend the money in this precinct. Um, but I would like to see money go to it. I would like to see that that come back to council with some funding attached for the something to happen in that precinct. Any further comments on the amendment? Councillor Hallett. Uh, just a question um, to the Director of Community Engagement. Um, I'm assuming that just receiving any of this funding, regardless of the amount, um, doesn't stop any of these applicants um, coming back to us at a later point for any of the other community grant um, processes to increase the amount in some way? Uh, through you, Mayor Coles, specifically, no. N none of our, um, our community funding policy doesn't preclude um, groups from seeking additional funding. Having said that, we, um, in any given financial year, do look to spread the love as much as possible. So it is looked at um, fairly closely as to whether we should support an individual group in two different grant um, schemes in one financial year, but our funding policy doesn't preclude it. Councillors, any further comments or questions on the amendment? I'll put it. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? Sorry, can we just do four again? Sorry. Okay, that's carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Loden. Uh, just a couple of questions to the director on the uh, calendar of events which was provided through, which was great to see. Um, I note that um, there's a youth event in Mount Hawthorne, Leedy Palooza, and then the artisan markets that are all sort of, I mean, obviously Lady Palooza goes for quite a long time, but they are on at the same time. Um, and was there discussions or is there an opportunity to look at preventing schedule clashes? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's certainly something that administration has identified that we would like to build into the process each year. At this point in time, generally speaking, unless it's gathering more information about their submission, uh, we don't insist that event organisers make any changes as part of their submission. Um, we, we generally just let the submission arrive and then assess it on its merits. Um, having said that, I think there is very strong value in, in administration looking at the calendar of events and recommending um, whether it be through the submission process or as part of um, the grant approval process to determine some dates so that we can get a, a good spread throughout the year. Um, our intent at this point in time is to quite simply go back to the event organisers on, on the back of this council decision making, share with them that um, events calendar and encourage them to look at changing dates to avoid um, clashes and to hopefully increase patronage at their particular event. And my second question was just around the Revolution, Revelation Film Festival. Obviously, this is happening very soon, so it's not an opportunity to change things now, but given the timing over NAIDOC week, is there a future opportunity to try and align that with what the city's doing in that space as well? Through you, Mayor Cole, very much so. And, and Revelation Film Festival have, uh, at least in my experience over the last couple of years, been very receptive to listening to our local community and actually keeping an eye on council decision making and council priorities and aligning at least part of their film program um, with some of those things. I can't quite recall whether it was last year or the year before on the, on the back of um, some of council's concerns around isolated seniors. They did have um, some, some films specifically focused around um, ageing populations and invited seniors to come and watch some of the films for free at the library. So um, I'll be confident that Revelation Film Festival would certainly be open to that um, type of integration. Um, I guess uh, my comment is that I was really happy to see that calendar of events. I felt last year like we had a lot of overlap of those events happening, so to see that they're, they're relatively reasonably spread out across the year is a good result. Um, you obviously can't get everything everywhere, but because the city is, I think it takes you, I live in the top north corner to get to the opposite corner, I think it takes me 12 minutes by car. 
So it's very reasonable to consider any of these events um, accessible by anybody in the City of Vincent. Um, I do have a concern that we continually each year seem to be increasing what we're sponsoring over time and I feel like we're getting to a, a bit of a saturation point on that. Um, I feel like there is lower turnouts at these events, that there's less enthusiasm because they're happening and there's there's events in all the town centres and at, we, I feel like we need to start a conversation about maybe some of these events happen every two years or like we've seen with North Perth Local, they're doing smaller events and maybe they alternate back and forth um, to give difference and variety in those activities as well. So I'd, I'd hope that we could see something like that happening in the future so that we don't have this continual growth. We're obviously seeing more ta town teams forming. If the expectation is that each of these town teams will run large events each year as well, then that's going to further push this, this, uh, this budget item up and I, I don't think there is my view personally, the demand for that. But I am very happy to support this, the officer's recommendation. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor Gonczewski? Um, I just want to echo Councillor Toppleberg's comments in relation to um, thanking um, the community engagement team for all their work in delivering these items for consideration. I think we're actually... I think that these festivals are really evolving in a positive direction. I think we are seeing some great um, variants and, and um, yes we are there's festivals that are happening not just in town centres in Vincent but across local governments now, a lot of people have um, uh, followed Vincent's lead in that regard but I love the fact that there's a um, sporting event um, we've got, um, we're taking our um, music and moving it from our parks into our laneways, I think that's fantastic I'm really looking forward to that and also looking at some of those um, you know, really local events that are going to bring families and people together in their town centres like the North Perth local um, Halloween I'm, so I, I'm really happy to support all these and um, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what um, comes of the um, emerging West End area in relation to the arts. Councillors, just to reiterate, um, I do also believe that there's a good diversity of events this year and I think there's a lot of evolution happening within the town teams themselves um, that is driving this as well as our community partnerships team seeking out new and um, exciting opportunities. It's good to see the summer concerts were really um, up against a lot of competition over the summer period and it's really good to see that evolve. Wham came in um, to that this year but it's good to see that evolve now into a laneways gig so that those partnerships are really starting to see that evolution and is being led by organisations who've got really good um, eye on what's what's workable and um, using local artists. Also just to say for, for someone like Leadable Connect to ride that wave of the large scale festival to note that it's you know it's had a few difficulties with weather that's had a big impact on their um, attendance and they've now sort of really picked up on the fact that fringe in February is massive and they're riding that wave and they've brought that into Leadville. I think that was really quite genius on behalf of Leadville Connect to, to transfer and change so quickly and to now be um, know, knowing that that is actually a really good formula with Leadville given that it lends itself so well to street closures. Um, it's, it's really great kudos to them. When you look down the list, the last remaining one day big street festival is actually Mount Hawthorne Streets and Lanes which um, again, it was great to see that despite some poor weather, um, that turnout from the Mount Hawthorne community was huge and really came out and supported that despite whatever was happening on the day. There's a great um, support for that from the local community, which I think is driving that um, as a success in that, in that formula of that one big festival event. So... Um, yeah, look, I think that there are the traditional events that we see every year, but there's also a lot of evolution and change. We're starting to see that crossover from festivals, films, music, arts, sport. So this, this for me, is um, quite a, a good and competitive line-up in what's becoming a pretty busy um, events schedule in Perth metropolitan area. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried.
Welcome back. <laughs> We're at item 13.2, Recruitment for Chief Executive Officer. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Move Councillor Harley, seconded Councillor Loden. I'm assuming everyone's read the report. It's it was, fairly yeah, self-explanatory. It was raised by Josh Toppelberg. Councillor Loden, do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Toppelberg, do you wish to speak to it? Uh, I don't know. I answered my question uh, between pulling it out and now, so I'm quite comfortable with the recommendation. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments in relation to this item? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Um, that is the end of our um, items for this evening, other than an item of urgent, uh, not urgent rather, a confidential item, 18.1. Um, so at this point we will end our live stream and we bid everyone <coughs> farewell who's tuned in. Um, and I'll now seek a mover and seconder to go behind closed doors. Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Castle. All those in favour? Declare it carried.